Okay, welcome to the work session for 4.30 p.m. of Tuesday, March the 26th. We're going to call the roll. Alderman Barnhill. Here. Alderman Blanton. Here. Alderman Caesar. Here. Alderman Peterson. Here. Alderman Berger. Present. Vice Mayor Brown. Present. I think that giggle was a yes, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. For me? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I said present. <laughs> uh, now, if you want to give Alderman me a Alderman Potts. <laughs> present. present. Alderman Baggett. Present. And the mayor's here also. <laughs> okay. Don't, if I'm going to laugh tonight, because I've got to. <laughs> uh, just to uh, tell you, if you have no objections, uh, Alderman Brown has a, a commitment a little later in the meeting and I'd like to move item number 12 to follow item number 6, if there's no objection to doing that. And if that's okay, we'll keep moving along. The first four items on the uh, agenda have to do with uh, event permits, one for Blackberry Jam Music, another one for Flash Frank Franklin Classic, uh, then the Heritage Ball, and then the Wind Down Main Street. So. Uh, if everybody's okay with those, those are recurring events that we see. And the, the only adjustment is the Blackberry Jam is a recurring event, but in a new location at Harlandsdale. So we're proud to host that event at Harlandsdale. But the other events are all ones we've had for many years and in, in, uh, involving city special events. So given that, if everybody's good, we'll move on to item five, which is potential phasing and estimated preliminary cost options for the old Paytonsville Road and Long Lane Bridge and Connector. City of Franklin project number 2019-015. So both items five and six deal with some of the capital investment project review that the board has undertaken over the last several months. Uh, we had a specific uh, desire for some further discussion on the Long Lane project, which had been identified in the previous uh, capital investment program and that we've been moving forward on for some time. And it's both the context of talking about the project itself, but also um, some phasing or alternatives that could be a, a lower cost version of, of what you had in your capital investment program overall. So that had come up in a previous discussion. Staff's done that work. We also did a review in terms of response uh, capability uh, from uh, our fire department. So we want to lay that information out for you and answer any questions you have as you consider that project with, with the rest of your capital investment, 10 year capital investment program. So I think Paul will kick it off and we have a group here ready to help answer any questions and share information with you. So we're glad to finally bring this one forward for discussion. There's a lot of work that was done by our city traffic engineer, Adam Mosier, and Jonathan Marston and our fire department team. So I'm going to walk you through the best I can all the facts and I'm going to turn it over to the fire department to talk a little bit about response time. Um, so essentially the purpose of the project was to just to provide more east-west connectivity, uh, similar fashion to Baker's, uh, Baker's Bridge. And if you remember when the fuel tanker crashed back in August of 2014, uh, that really caused major issues with a full closure on uh, Goose Creek and they were required to use I-65 sure. or use the ramps as a bypass lane to accommodate I-65. Um, that was a really hard time. We set up a lot of different traffic control to try to reroute traffic, but it really highlighted why connectivity is such an important thing in a, in a uh, transportation system. So some of the history on it was this project got added to the major thoroughfare plan in 2003-2004 uh, timeframe. During the widening of I-65, the second phase of that project, we approached TDOT and had some discussions about a potential, at the time it was an underpass. They rejected that concept and said, but we would be more than willing to accommodate an overpass. And there's lots of good reason and logic as to why they let us down that path. Um, and ultimately TDOT agreed to build three of the bridge piers uh, associated with Long Lane. And the purpose of that was to ensure that we didn't have to get back out into I-65 and do large amounts of lane closures and shift traffic and EPSC, and it would just it just made a lot of sense at that time uh, to, to partner with them to do that. They funded 100% of that project. What they had done is asked us to pass a resolution essentially letting TDOT know that we were committed to the project. And so in January 22nd, 2013, we passed a re resolution essentially stating that it was a priority project and that funding would be committed over the next several years to uh, complete that project. 
Um, so that's a lot of the history associated with how it came about. I'm going to jump to some of the traffic projections uh, that Adam Mosier has put together for us. And uh, the existing volumes associated with Long Lane is around 3,100, which is the average annual daily traffic on the road. Uh, and once development is built out in that area, he's estimating, and I strongly am going to say the word estimating because it is really, really difficult to, to get these numbers exactly correct. He's estimating around 5,000 vehicles a day once there's approved, with the approved development of what would be on that bridge if it got built. Um, Long-term projections, uh, he's estimating around 6,425 uh, is that annual average daily traffic. You compare that to something like Baker's Bridge has about 10,000 vehicles a day on it. Again, there's a lot of assumptions that go into these models. There's things that really impact that, such as school zoning. If school zoning were to change, that would have a big impact. Future development would have a uh, big impact. So a lot of the undeveloped areas out in Goose Creek, those numbers are not slated in that background approved development number. And so we're having to make a lot of assumptions on what that would be long term. Uh, what we've done is looked at, or Jonathan has done, is looked at two options. What you're seeing up there is uh, the option A, which is full build out. And this essentially eliminates a lot of the gaps that would be existing. I'm gonna attempt to make it bigger and highlight it. Is there's an unimproved section of Long Lane right here in front of the Ag Center. And there's an unimproved section along Old Paytonsville Road right here out in front of Berry Farms. Um, and so those are really the two difference between the options uh, that cause a difference in price. So the full build out, which is the option you're looking at, we're estimating to be about $39.1 million. Uh, and we're gonna jump to... And those are elements, some of which were, were added over the years from when this project was first considered. It was really just the overpass. Would have been what you can switch yeah, it's more like this, this okay. option. So as we looked at it, staff identified, while you're doing this, these other improvements would really help the overall uh, functionality of the roadway. So those elements were added. And so that's, that's what you see in the full project. And th this, this option really represents sort of a return to that initial that's correct. Kind of base project. <clears throat> so this project we're estimating at $28.2 million. What will happen is you'll be left with an unimproved section here around, on Old Paytonsville Road, if you can see my cursor there, and you'll be left with an unimproved section here on Long Lane. Um, ideally, we'd like to get it all done while we're out there, but we get the limited resources, limited funding, and trying to spread it around. So we wanted to present both these options. There are other options available within the options, I'd say, such as do you build sidewalk on the north side of Old Paytonsville Road uh, on the county side that could easily be eliminated. And, and street lighting is another thing that could be uh, eliminated, just do them at the major intersections. So there are sub options within the options, but this is primarily the two choices that you have as it relates to building it. Again, we'd have to build the <coughs> intersection at Lewisburg and Paytonsville Road would need to be built with this project. Uh, signalized. signalized, yes, ma'am. Assuming it meets warrants. Well, but isn't the long range plan for Captain Freeman to be the signalized? It has never there? been for Captain no, Freeman not. to be signalized. Never. No, never. We've never had in the plan. Okay. The spacing doesn't work. It's too close. This would be and this having isn't a collector. Too close to impact? Uh, it's closer than we'd like, but it's actually a, because it's a collector and arterial road, the volumes are going to be substantially higher than what you would see on Captain Freeman. Sorry, um, Bert interjecting there oh. no very good question great question um i'd also at this point i'd like to turn it over uh, to our fire department they did a quick evaluation on response times so i'm going to turn it over to daniel donegan and uh, uh battalion chief jenkins to talk through that well, good afternoon everyone uh, battalion chief jenkins with the fire department and uh as uh, paul has mentioned we uh, have been asked to come in and weigh in on emergency response and the impact that the overpass would play into that mm -hmm. as you know in our field uh, we are planning for the worst case scenario and in the past uh, we've we've seen some of the uh, outcries from what happens with the bridge is taken out and that, that type of matter so in this particular case, uh, the bridge would obviously uh, give us some more depth. It'd give us other options. Um, 
you may have a packet in front of you, uh, you should have. And some of that information in there, it says the UL Research Institute suggests that you only have three minutes to escape a house fire. So time is not in our favor or not on our side in the fire service when we're responding to these emergencies in particular fires. Um, if you'll note above uh, the 65 mile marker, we have a road uh, intersection, if you will, about approximately every one mile. Um, and then from 65 mile marker down to Goose Creek area, you're looking at 3.82 miles. So each side of the interstate through there is kind of a void space and station seven is well equipped to handle single calls there. But in the event we have fires, we rely on our, our other stations to backfill and to respond to those areas. And that's part of our response plan. So uh, having more depth and capacity to infiltrate that area from the north uh, is very critical to our response. So uh, fire analyst, analyst uh, Daniel Donegan has got some more information about the times and how that is impacted uh, with the bridge versus not. Yes, so um, you can see in your packet, um, we utilized basically option B on this, on what uh, Paul and him were proposing there to run these times. And each of those times are at different variations across the bridge. None of these have any influence with traffic um, or time of day. It is just a straight shot of what's faster running through Esri's uh, network and analyst system there. So from Berry Farms to Enderley going across the bridge there, um, cutting up, um, you can see it's a six minute and all of this is in hundreds, by the way. It's not actual time. So it's 6.25 uh, minutes going across without a bridge. If you utilize that bridge, you have a two minute and 38 second um, time savings there. So that would require that unit to go south all the way down to Goose Creek, come back up Long Lane. Um, so roughly that's a two minute savings there. Um, if we go down to um, looking at the next group of um, Station 2 responses, those are ideal responses uh, for second in units. Um, and you can see uh, just going Station 2 to Ladd Park, um, that's I-65, the first option, which is just over eight minutes. Um, the second option would be if they had to go down South Carruthers. Um, it's almost a nine minute response there. Um, and then if that last option, which would be with the overpass, um, you're gaining uh, 1.28 time savings there. Um, so that is them going Mac Hatcher to Lewisburg Pike and cutting across that bridge um, to get into Ladd Park. Um, station five, which is another station, that would be a second due for Berry Farms and Ladd Park there. Um, you can see that they have a, just about a two and a half minute savings utilizing that bridge versus um, static drive time. And then going to Enderley um, is about the same with two minute savings. In station five, no. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Station 5 is Noah Drive. Um, Station 2 is off Murfreesboro Road there at Mack Hatcher. All the... From the Hampton Inn to Station 5. May I ask a question, Mayor? Sure, go ahead. I'll... So all of this is taught is more addressing backfilling, not the idea that Station 7 was put out there to serve this community. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That sounds like a smart aleck, but I mean, that's just the truth. Station 7 was built where it was built to serve Carruthers, the Ladd Park, Goose Creek community. So all of these statistics are, are more on backfilling that Station 7 responding. Yes, ma'am. Just clear. Um, if they if Station 7 needed to go to the back side of Berry Farm, um, now forget the road, Paul, you might be able to help me, um, where the commercial area is, the bridge does cut down on that response time, but as they start getting down into Berry Farms, um, it was basically null um, whether, which way they came in. Um, but if we were to lose that bridge, the Goose Creek Bypress bridge again, um, or as congestion builds on that bridge, um, the routing would send you back up um, Long Lane to the proposed new bridge. I'll run back. And first of all, this is super important. It's also a $40 million bridge. <laughs> so, I mean, we, 45. it's 45 million. Um, are we, we don't have this now and we have our ISO one rating. Is there anything 
projected in our any kind of plans or build out that that this would not having this would jeopardize an ISO rating because I feel like that's mostly on the first arrival truck. Um, I, does that make sense? I mean, we don't want to jeopardize the ISO, but also it's a forty million dollar bridge, and we got to kind of weigh cost benefit and number of cars. Um, so ISO does play into this a little. Um, so ISO, you have I'd have to look back at my exact notes. I believe it's seven hundred twenty seconds for the second due company to arrive, and that has to be a um, tower. So right now, our second due tower would be utilizing that. Um, coming out of station two, which is utilizing the I-65 or South Carruthers Pass. And this is only for in, structure fires. For structure fires. And also only structure fires that happen if an oil tanker hits the Paytonsville Road br exit bridge. So it's 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 only Any structure fire. Any excuse, structure fire. Well yeah yeah. But this it's, is if it's out of commission it's a different discussion. You're talking about a tanker hitting taking the bridge out. This is talking about response to any structure fire with Just in general. the road network fully functioning. Right. Okay. So what we're weighing is the necessity of the $40 million bridge. We have the cross-connectivity now. You, these things, I mean, it, we, you, can you can still cross-connect now. But if it goes out, then these times, if, if the Paytonsville Road Bridge, the interstate access, or the interstate bridge that exists now, is out, then we will have these times. These time savings. These are the times for a second unit. Yes, to sir. Respond the to a station two fire. with the long lane overpass. Right, which is the, the only one point two. Which is what you need. You savings. need a second unit. I'm just trying to line up the response. series of things that have to happen where this is an issue, and the thing that has to happen for us to, if we don't have a Brit, um, the the, we have to have another tanker truck hit the thing, and then we can't get across it. And, you, th and so we need this to improve our times. The, these, this time difference exists with- With or without the bridge? Well, this is the difference between having the overpass and not having the overpass. Got it. So this makes it easier for the second unit Understood. to get there in a more timely basis. That's not the bridge being taken out. That's just a general response. Because to respond yeah. to a structure fire, you need more than one unit. All right, I'm clear yeah. now. Yeah. But it will not affect our ISO rating. I think that's an important thing for us to know. Um, this bridge will get built. Just when? Yeah. To be honest, I can't say that it Is would that not affect it. Is that a fact that it affects your ISO rating or not? Yeah, so the second due tower um, could affect our ISO rating. Um, right now, we have not had a lot of structure fires in that area, so we have not had to analyze that against our ISO rating. Um, so as call volume increases, uh, the more people move in, the more the higher the risk of structure fires in that area. So then we would have to start reporting that to ISO, and at that point, we would determine how that's affecting our rating. But truth be told, again, I sound like redundant, Station 7 helped us improve our ISO rating, which is why we built it. Yes, ma'am. So it's like we're, I mean, it's like we're trying to plan for worst case scenario, which is not always a bad thing, unless you have other more pressing things that need to happen. So it, this scenario is planning for the worst case. Station 7 was built to address this whole entire part of our city yes ma'am uh, and it helped our iso rating especially for the people who live in lad park and lockwood Glen, and all those other newly developed subdivisions station seven was a gift absolutely and now that gift has turned old and it's time to buy a backup gift in case they don't like the first one um, when we respond to uh, structure fires that's not a single company response. That's five to six, seven additional units, and that is part of ISO. We have to put so many personnel on the scene within so many minutes. Um, so part of that is this data that uh, Daniel is proposing or presenting here tonight is just showing with the overpass, it gives us the capacity for those second due in units that's coming in from the, the west and the east side north of seven uh, to get there a little, a little faster. And some of it's pretty significant, I think up to two, two and a half minutes. And if, you know, as we mentioned earlier, um, 
fire doubles every minute in some publications and it, you know in ul sites a three minute uh, timeline that you have to get out of your home hopefully that's we don't encounter that but we wanted to be able to present you with the information for the board to be able to make a good judgment and, and there's a lot of things to consider there uh, but uh, single resource and that is if station seven is available they may be out on a call already for service they may be on a medical call they may be on the interstate uh, so then in that case, because they're a single unit uh, house, um, that we will be, we completely rely on those units north of that location to respond to that area. And that's where those seconds do count. So it's just. How does the uh, rescue squad building at the other end of Goose Creek come into play? I mean, I would imagine just being human beings, if it's an all hands on deck, they could cross lines and help us if need be. Is that true? Uh, in the event of um, a fire that uh, we're short on manpower or resources, uh, we can request mutual aid, but that is a formal request through the dispatch and if they're sure. available, yes, ma'am. Because that's another thing to consider at the other end of Goose Creek. Were you finished, Alderman Baggett? I am. Uh, one more question. There, you said there's that one. Count, that contradicts what you just said. <laughs> I am finished, but I got one more question. <laughs> Go ahead. I am not finished, and I have one more question. Um, there can we have one unit or one one tower at seven now you said the second so the second responding has to be a, a tower i mean it's two and a half million dollars for another tower or right i mean it so again thinking at we have the capacity for another tower at seven we do have the capacity the room the logistics in the building itself that would uh, require us uh, potentially hiring more personnel and added, adding the the apparatus yes and i think that's what we got to think about because again like i said this bridge is going to get built at some point but that two and a half million dollar tower and crew that will ultimately be needed there because of this build out even in a short term before say growth explodes down there and with this isn't done yet you still can have the second we can still maintain our iso with some changes with more cost effective with a like buying doing another tower crew over there so that we do if it really became an issue we're dealing with tons of hypotheticals and we have a big decision to make, but we've got, um, I'll let other folks talk when we get back to the traffic I've, count. I've got Alderman Barnahill uh, next, but I wanted to ask a quick question uh, whenever you said build out. Does that take into account all the property we've annexed uh, down in Southeast Franklin? No, the 100% build out is essentially approved development and then taking back row, background traffic and just ramping it up slightly. It doesn't it include is. what's going to happen on the no, thousand sir. acres we've annexed in that area. No, sir, it does not. Okay, good. Go, go ahead, Alderman Barnhill. See, I, uh, I, think the, I think the emphasis should not necessarily be all together on the fire department unless no. you guys are the only ones going to be using the bridge, <laughs> which is not the reason we're building it. You've got, what did you say, 5,000 cars per day that you're estimating using that besides the fire department? So when we did this project, this was the number one capital improvements project several years ago presented by the board, $22 million at that time. And I understand this, the price has gone up. But, this, but I don't think there's anything that's happened to reduce the importance of this particular bridge the state built the, the uh, pillars and we said at some point in time we were going to put a bridge there and connect the two sides so i think it's important for us to recognize that we're not just talking about what happens to the fire department we're looking to do whatever we need to do to make the reaction times satisfactory but there'll be a there'll, there'll be a lot more people than five thousand by the time you get this thing built, if it were to start today being built. But, uh, and, and again, I would like to maybe just look at a little bit, because if I'm not mistaken, we, it was 22 million when we first put it on there. Do you, uh, what what is, has it gone up that much? It has. Okay. Let's go mostly inflation? Well, or probably the, the apples to apples would be the 28. That's the 28 million to what you considered whatever it was four okay. years ago when you did the capital investment program so what we did add to the scope is the additional road improvements 
so that that's what's the difference between the 28 and the 39 million as a construction number. So 28 to 22 is probably your probably right. inflated number in terms of what we've seen in terms of project costs. And we added the signalized intersection. This essentially what you're seeing on the screen right now, the bridge itself is what you approved at 22. Well, uh, yeah. So the, the signalized signal. was not it in was that not 22. Okay, okay no, so that's not. a big swing too. It didn't go up that far. Anybody else got a comment? Alderman Brown, I'm sorry. I didn't oh, right. re remember oh, recognizing you. No, that's all right. Um, <clears throat> on the ISO, uh, 700 seconds for that second unit to respond, it's about 12 minutes, and you've got about nine minutes without the bridge. So we got, nobody up here is playing fast and loose with fire and safety. I, I wanna be really clear about that. But to, to Alderman Baggett's point, prioritization of sort of those funds, it looks like we could even hit the still our, our top rating even in, even in 700 seconds easily without that bridge there. But I agree, it's not just about the fire. You know, I had this on and off, you know, the list. I ultimately left it on the list, it's not about not doing it. I'm with you and, and Alderman Bar yeah. Barnhill, you will get done eventually. It's about prioritization of when it gets done. And quite honestly, part of it for me was when we get snubbed by the state to do the Southeast Mac Atcher and don't get included in any of those infrastructure dollars, that just puts more pressure on other areas of the city in the Southeast that need need help. And so for me, it's it's if, if they had come through and did what we needed them to do to help us build the, get out south uh, Southeast Mac Atcher, we could have done a little bit at Lewisburg. Maybe this would have been completely fine in the plan, but now we got to think about what we're doing. Mac Hatcher, Lewisburg, all that Spring Hill traffic. There's just only so many dollars, and where's the biggest priority to move the traffic? And that's for me. It's not about if we build a bridge; it's about when we build the bridge and the sequencing of everything else that needs to be done in the southeast. Go ahead, Alderman Caesar. And just to build a little bit upon what Alderman Brown has just shared, I think throughout all of our surveys of the community number one issue that comes up is traffic and infrastructure. Number one issue is traffic and infrastructure. Not to displace safety and certainly the fire response time here. We're appreciative of the quick response time. We're very fortunate to live in a community that values response time and thinks about um, how do we make sure that we maintain our ISO rating. Um, but I, I just echo, if it's not started, it will never begin. And we know that traffic and development and growth is going to happen in the southeast quadrant of our city. We know that if this building, or the, I'm sorry, this bridge were to be approved today, it would be many years before it's actually functional. I don't know if we have an estimate. If we were to start it and approve it this week. It, it is approved right now. Now, obviously you have the option to try to change that. Sure. It really depends on the option that you pick. If you pick the full build out, your right away acquisition doubles, if not more in size, and that's what's gonna add a lot of time. If you pick the smaller option, I would say you have about two years of right-of-way acquisition. If you pick the bigger option, it's probably three years of right-of-way acquisition, which we're about at that point to where we can start acquiring. And so three years of right-of-way acquisition, how much time of for the whole construction? For the, three years. So two years of right-of-way, three years of construction. So if I'm doing math, five years yes. from today yeah. till yeah. this bridge is functional and useful. Yes. I would just ask my fellow board members, do you think that there will be a substantial increase in traffic and development in the Southeast Quadrant that would justify this five years from today? And that's the question I'm struggling with. Um, anybody, I'm gonna get, come up here and then I'll go back to people who wanna make a follow-up comment. And I do have a number of speaker cards. Go ahead, Alderman Potts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a question. One of, uh, one of the aldermen made reference to getting another tower, <clears throat> uh, another tower apparatus. How long would it take for us to get another tower apparatus and have it in Station 7 and to have it manned? Two years. A couple years, two, three years, probably. Uh, it's two to three years build out on the apparatus if we place the order today as we've been <laughs> talking about. And we are, uh, we've been proactive in some of those measures or, or seeking that. Uh, personnel, it, you know, as the as the market goes, we would we would bring those on. So, it's it's a two to three year process probably on the tower if we pulled the trigger today. And then your staffing is going to be a full shift, uh, well three shifts, and that's well over a million dollars of staffing costs um, right there. So you've got well a, over what I'm sorry, a million dollars a year staffing costs. A million dollars a year in staffing mm -hmm. costs. Mm -hmm. Probably plus. probably twelve uh, yeah. additional staff. Sixteen personnel. Yeah. I'm sorry, I misquoted. So you're probably more like a million and a half okay. plus. 
and of staffing. Uh, no, another question for you, and again, not just to focus on fire. I think Alderman Barnhill hit it. There's a lot of aspects that we're looking at tonight, but since you gentlemen are here at the table first, um, how often is Station 7 called out where they are on site providing support, emergency services, and another station has to be called in to uh, uh, cover what would be 7? I wouldn't want to answer that without actually doing an analysis, yeah. and um, I have not done that, so I don't want to give you false numbers. Okay. That's all for now. Alderman Berger. Uh, I just want to ask a question here, and Eric, um, maybe you can help with this. Um, as development happens in that area, all in that Goose Creek area, uh, do we have any way to obtain more dollars from that development to help cover these costs that can be allotted to this? I, I don't know if it would qualify for any of the impact fee. Collector. It would be a collector impact fee eligible, so you'd have to look at what would be generated there. Um, you've got, obviously, other elements of the collector and arterial system that need to be built yeah. out with development as well in that area. So. There is a potential funding component um, with that collector component, but um, like I said, you got other 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 needs that would yeah. also fill that definition, yeah. competing was, with it as well. So at this point, we've funded what we have in hand, mm -hmm. which is looking at, at uh, those existing dollars through largely um, our bond-funded capital. Yeah, I was just curious about that. And uh, is there any any anything out there in way of grants for this in relationship to safety for fire and rescue and things of that nature that we have maybe not taken a hard look at yet or could possibly we always keep an eye out for that i'm not aware of anything specifically that fits okay. this but that's always something we yeah. look for opportunities on um well, just yeah, like it's not it's not considered part of the state <laughs> or federal network, so that kind of cuts mm -hmm. out certain certain funding options. But um, yeah, I, you, you never say never because you never know we what know might that. fit something. Yeah. But uh, there's not something that is readily available that okay. we know and of. I at submitted this, point. this as part of the last time we did the regional transportation yeah. program at, at the at the regional level with the MPO, and oh, yeah. it, it did not make the list. But the MPO it was not. Make it was it, yeah. It's not okay. a it's not of regional significance. Right. Well. <clears throat> Okay, maybe it's not regional or significant, but uh, Brandy, get ready. I'm gonna say the bingo word. Uh, <laughs> are you ready? Uh, so like in McEwen, <laughs> we can't, we know this, our bingo, <laughs> no, it was, uh, we were playing a game here, but <laughs> but anyway, um, we, we did, you know, it's a city road and we didn't know how that would go. And then we got two different grants, extensive grants. Uh, we had economic development over there, we had safety, we had schools over there. I'm just wondering if uh, we just keep looking then. I, that's my comment. Just keep looking because we, we have this big safety factor here with growth and schools in the area mm -hmm. as well. So maybe there's something out there that we can look at. And I, I know you're pretty good at that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always on the lookout for, yeah. for new opportunities. So, I mean, there, I've even looked at opportunities. There's even the there's even a program now, the, the, the reconnecting communities opportunities where originally the interstates cut through back in the 60s cut right. through and uh, but but again those are not really for this particular even though uh, you know if you read the history of this one and i included some of the history documents in this one just as they were they were interesting because you know the old paytonsville road obviously used to be paytonsville yes. road it cut across paytonsville road used to come straight across long lane teed into paytonsville road right where the interstate's at today and took that so out. technically the interstate created the gap and created mm -hmm. those two frontage roads so, I mean, just by looking at the face of it, yeah, you could almost submit for one of those reconnecting community grants, but it doesn't really qualify for that grant program if you read deeper into it. So we always look for those opportunities, yeah. but it really doesn't right. qualify for a lot well, of them. Well, thank you very The much. other piece with McEwen that I think helped it, and Jonathan can probably speak to this, it is seen as a much more viable east-west connector across the, it, the region. It, it actually does serve as an east-west connector between us and Smyrna. Yeah. And, and yeah. actually now with us working th within the last year it's and a strange. half, that is actually about to become, that, that is the kind of the last corridor east-west connector that we've worked as yeah. basically every community between Franklin and Smyrna, including the counties, has yeah. now designated mm -hmm. McEwen, Clovercroft, Rocky Fork, mm -hmm. all the way through Smyrna, including in a, 
potential future interchange on I-24 as being that future east-west yeah. corridor that we're all you know going to reserve right away in the future. <laughs> Luckily for us, it was pretty easy because it's only McEwen Drive on our end, and we we're pretty much getting yeah, towards the, the final portions of that between I-65 and I-24. But but that's you all know right. that was kind of the last chance we had on the, on that particular corridor yeah. to say hey. Let's finally reserve something because, you know, subdivisions kept popping up in the middle, you know, just over time, over the last 20, 25 years, we've talked about getting another east-west corridor mm -hmm. and they popped up in the way and well, blocked off like keep, Sam Ridley Parkway. Keep your eyes down on that computer and see if you can find something. So that's, We're yeah, always on the lookout. yep. And that's an example where McEwen started at 10 million of federal money and that's grown into 30 now because it has that, that regional impact. And so we've been able to make that case. Uh, so we look for those where we can. I think what Jonathan's telling you, this is localized enough that it's probably not a, a great candidate for those, but we keep putting it in us. and we'll look well, at it. I think but, there's yeah. anything out there that's probably safety Absolutely. related. A uh, re-question on yeah. Alderman Baggett well, this and back to Alderman Potts after that. This was in uh, response to Alderman Caesar's question, and it was a thing that I've been working with staff on today, getting traffic counts, because I saw the numbers of 6,500 estimated by 2046, and to Alderman Brown and other points that have been made, is we've actually got a problem. If you were at the um, short farm presentation at Joint Conceptual, and you saw the, Mac, the uh, Adam Mosier's um, presentation on Mac Hatcher Northwest, mm -hmm. where Hillsborough Road and Mac Hatcher is failing right now, where there's 20,000 cars that pass that bridge a day, today. Mm -hmm. 20,000. In 22 more years, there'll be 6,500 cars going over the Long Lane Bridge. But there's 20,000 cars today who are stopped at Mac Hatcher and Hillsborough Road, and they're gradually queuing up till they hit Spencer Creek like they're going to First Methodist Church. And, and by 2030, his numbers, not mine, roughly 32,000 cars will be using that road. You know what happens when you can't go west on Mac Hatcher and that bridge? We need another bridge. That's where I'm going with this. Uh, and it's, you know what happens is they start going back downtown. They, they don't take that because it's not effective. They start going back downtown, and then your 33% 30, reduction in traffic we've had in downtown because of Matt Catcher, Northwest opening, they start coming through downtown. And so, by the way, this bridge is not on TDOT's plan. It wasn't even considered to be denied under this recent plan because it wasn't on any of our plans. We know we need it. Well, we got the last one. It worked. And now it's failing. It's going to fail. It's going to continue to fail. We're looking at all, every piece of land, including Brownland, uh, all, any development in that area is going to be impacted by that intersection. But we got this bridge here that's $40 million, and there's 3,300 people that are going to use it when it opens up in 6,500 in 22 years. And so we got these other 32,000 people that are traversing a major corridor that would otherwise be going through our downtown. And I'm sitting here, and it's not even on TDOT's radar, which means we got another 10 years. Maybe we, if we get their new 10-year plan, maybe we're 15 years out for that if we don't start pushing on this now and, and allocating some funding and then giving the opportunity for development in, in and around to help contribute towards that bridge. I'm not, it's not an either or either this bridge or that bridge. It's really not. But we would behoove us not to sit here and just ask the question, 6,500 people in 22 years mm -hmm. or 30 or 20,000 this year or 32,000 in five years that are going to be backed up past Spencer Creek. We have to look at this in holistically and take the southeast Mac catcher, the northwest bridge. And unfortunately, this is a 40 million dollar bridge that's got 6,500 cars probably going to be going across it. And it's kind of like it's making an all-saw question. It that doesn't mean it shouldn't be built, but I encourage my fellow aldermen to let's. We need to think about Mac Hatcher. If that means we have a Mac Hatcher package with all these Mac Hatcher things, we we bundle up together and go to T dot and, and get and do something. And maybe we you know think of some creative financing ways to do it. We better do it, or else in five years. 2030, they're going to be backed up to Spencer Creek Golf, and we will be getting phone calls out the kazoo. And I'm telling you, I empathize with the folks of Lyde Park used to live there. But we have to think about 
we got to think about this. This is a major issue affecting today almost 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so we just got to think about it. Uh, I'm, you know, 40 million here, 40 million there. $40 million for this bridge also is 60% of the cost of sticks and bricks of City Hall. This is not just like, well, let's just do it. This is a, so the sticks and bricks of City Hall, the 70 million of sticks and bricks. This is not a small thing. This is not just a, well, like, we got a lot of need now. We better be looking at all creative options, but I, that's why I would encourage us to, to really think about it. I'm going to go back to Alderman Potts, and then I'm going to have a public comment. Go ahead, Alderman Potts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate what Alderman Baggett has said. I think that there is a lot there, uh, but I do have questions about the information that's in front of us. So I uh, want to ask Paul or Jonathan, do you, either of y'all, if you are looking at your traffic count on what you have late, uh, on the screen there, on the, uh, if you will, as you came from east to west and you hairpin back around onto the frontage road, were there any traffic counts that were done on what would run parallel to the interstate or were there any traffic counts specific to the intersection at Lewisburg? On Old Paytonville? Yes. I don't believe there's any, and we can, I think Paul's looking real quick here. Uh, I don't believe there were any on the, what we consider the frontage road section. I don't believe they would take any down there. We'd come closer to finding some on the, uh, towards the intersection. I don't know they would be on, on Old Paytonville specifically, probably more on Lewisburg, but we can, if we, if we can't find them tonight, we can actually look those up and get those back to you. Yeah, I believe what Adam was doing was using the Goose Creek comprehensive study we did mm -hmm. and using that model to determine these projections and didn't necessarily drill it up <clears throat> on those different legs today. And then he was as also using the data from any development study that was pertinent that had been done within the last two or three years. He was using that data as well. Yeah, the other the other item I'm just going to throw out is with these traffic projections, I'm going to use Mac Hatcher Northwest as an example. Those, what we projected traffic wise day one, and when it opened, it was substantially higher. Could be the same thing here. I mean, you just you just don't know. It's it's hard to predict how routes and, and directions and people are going to change. This is brand new one. There's a lot of assumptions that go into it is what I wanted to throw out there. And, and it might be helpful for us to give you some numbers about the volumes we see existing on Goose Creek mm -hmm. now, because you brought up the, the, the Mac Hatcher comparison. Yep. I think it'd be that might be a good volume to, to just put in the mix here as well. Absolutely, and I, th I think that is a, a very valid point. I think it ties up with what Alderman Baggett's saying right there. You build it, you open it, and mm -hmm. our projections are off. Uh, the other question that I had was actually back on to fire for just a minute, and I guess maybe this could be applied across the city, but since we're talking about infrastructure right here, uh, does it put us at all in a position of being um, uh, into any type of a legal, uh, legal position and not being able to reach those that need emergency services if we don't build certain infrastructure and we're delayed by times? I don't see a lot of uh, raising of hands wanting to we're not, jump we're not, on that. Alderman, we're not really going to be able to answer that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, we distribute, we do a good job of planning out and distributing stations and apparatus and personnel. Yeah. Now, at any given time, you get pulled in different directions to respond to different calls. So, you know, I had a fire chief years ago tell me we can have a fire station on every corner or we can have one small volunteer department. It's across the spectrum. And so different folks do it different ways. We've chosen a pretty high level of service, mm -hmm. the ISO 1 response uh, target in terms of fire response. We do try to keep that in mind as we do everything we do, but also recognizing emergency medical response is critically important. And that's why we look at how we distribute those. So, um, you know, we, we, uh, we have a high service standard and we ha do extensive planning and these folks do a lot of work on that to make sure we're putting the right folks in the right place to respond to what comes our way. Good, thank you. Okay, please line up at the podium as follows. You have two minutes each. Steve Abernathy, Don Harlan, Rich Buckner, Maggie Shelton, Kelly Brown, Mike Blair, Nancy Laxton, Clark Miller, and last but not least, Matt uh, Begano. Steve? Thank you. Uh, 
Steve Abernathy. My wife and I have lived in uh, Ladd Park at 152 Clyde Circle since February of 2015. First, I want to thank Mayor Moore and all the aldermen here tonight uh, for their willingness to serve in the positions they serve uh, to make Franklin an even better place. You have a tough job, long hours, many, many emails, many phone calls, so thank you for that. Uh, it's been almost 10 years ago. Ten years that was ago, entertaining, this, wasn't it? <laughs> it was me, no. Don't take that up. There was a terrible no. semi-truck accident at Goose Creek Overpass that claimed the life of the driver and created a state of emergency in this part of, we in uh, Lad Park, that state of emergency. The Lad Park residents suffered uh, greatly during the 102 days until it was reopened. Uh, one lady in particular had to take her child to daycare and it, the route she had to take because you got to remember Carruthers wasn't open at the time. They hadn't finished the bridge. It was 45 minutes one way to get the child to daycare. What if that happened today? There's thousands of new homes that have been built along Lewisburg and Carruthers Pike since that time, and uh, many new businesses. I think Dave Ramsey is an example of a huge one that was built. Uh, you've got everything that's been developed along Berry Farms, uh, Publix, uh, the hotels. All this depends on Goose Creek Overpass for employees to get to work and also customers. The long lane overpass cost has increased significantly because of the delays that have occurred over the years. Initially, in 2013, it was estimated $6.7 million. Then in March of 2017, it increased to $14 million. November of 2020, it was $24 million. And now, the latest number I saw from one of the meetings you had was $45.7 million. And I think, Eric, you said $5 million had already been spent for right away or something along that. One of the keys to a, a wonderful community is having good traffic as far as moving the uh, folks around. Franklin residents need options both north and south and east and west. North and south, we're in pretty good shape in the, Lewis, in the southern part of uh, Franklin. We've got Lewisburg Pike, I-65, and Brothers Parkway. East and west, not so good. We've got Goose Creek, A and 840, after you get past Highway 96. Residents south of Highway 96 have only those two locations, and it's woefully inadequate. Where the north of 65, you've got an overpass or underpass every mile all the way, and we've only got the two really in that six mile radius. The Long Lane overpass and the improvements to Long Lane are critical to South Franklin residents. Current estimate from Jonathan Marston if you give him the green light tonight, construction can begin 5 1 of 2026 with completion by 2028. In closing, the Goose Creek overpass is unlikely to be damaged as it was in August of 2014, but it could happen. And that changes everything the fire department said earlier and everything. There's a busy truck stop at that exit and there have already been at least four tractor trailers that have rolled over on their side on the overpass. We've been extremely lucky. None of them were carrying hazardous material. So you need to remember those factors into it also. Thank you again for your service and thanks for listening. My name's Don Harlan. My wife and I live at 4008 General Martin Lane in Berry Farms. I'm currently the president of the Berry <coughs> Farms HOA. Just a quick disclaimer, our HOA is completely autonomous from Boyle Investments, Boyle Development, and any of their representatives. As a community, we really appreciate what, Bo what Boyle, city leaders, staff has done to make our community what it is. Berry Farms' viewpoint of the capital improvement project reassessment is aligned with the Franklin Alliance of HOAs in the Third Ward, which uh, Rich, is, uh, which is following me, will give you a little more detail about that. This represents 21 HOAs in the Third Ward. All of you received uh, our uh, document that outlines some of uh, the initiatives and priorities that HOA repre that FAHOA represents. These priorities are of no particular order, but do focus on projects in our third ward, working from a northern to a southern boundaries. These things, these items are such as revamping the intersections of Mac Hatcher and Forest Crossing, Lewisburg Pike and Mac Hatcher, and Donaldson Creek and Lewisburg Pike and an overall enhancement of Lewisburg Pike all the way to the southern city, city boundary. These could be done from not only state funding, but from local and developer funding as well. If the fly, long lane flyover maintains its position, 
as a high priority on the CIP list. Communities on both sides of Old Paytonville Road request traffic mitigation through our areas. Berry Farms' concern is that traffic will shortcut through us to get over to the south side of our community, which is where the commercial is. That coupled with the fact of 406 residences and apartments already approved in the fall of 2021 have yet to be built and will create, create even more internal traffic for us. The extension of Goose Creek over to an extension of Carruthers Road, and it's labeled as ST16003 in, in this uh, document packet of documents, is another possibility that could help with the east-west. So you'll uh, wind on up, please, Mr. Harlan. Excuse me. Please wind up. I am. I'm going. Well, it could be, could be combined with the uh, with the priorities on this list, and it could be funded by local and developer dollars that it could lessen the demand for east-west traffic if at least some of it were developed for retail. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Rich Buckner. As Don said, kind of introduced me. I'm the, uh, the director of the Franklin Alliance of HOAs for Ward 3. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of all 21 of our communities. They represent nearly 7,000 homes. None of the communities have any issues with what I'm about to say. I have 100% agreement with my remarks. I will not speak about a specific project, but I'm going to speak more about the big picture in Ward 3. We arguably will be the fastest growing ward in the next 10 years. Ward 3 is attractive, not because we have an hourglass figure. In our case, it's not a great thing. It's just geography. We have three north to south corridors in Ward 3, I-65, Carruthers, and Lewisburg. Two of those are state highways. Our hourglass figure creates pinch points on traffic. These pinch points are north of the future growth and all 21 of our communities are concerned because nearly half of our communities, of our residents, live north of those pinch points. The others live south. We endorse a north to south strategy in thinking about capital improvement. Simply said, the strategy is to address an existing road con congestion before or concurrent with new projects. This is not a Ward 3 issue. If Ward 3 will be the fastest growing ward in Franklin in the next 10 years, bottlenecking the roads, in essence, bottlenecks Franklin's growth and prosperity for those 10 years. We really thank you guys for all that you do for the city and making it a great place to live. And just please keep the, those comments in mind. I'm Maggie Shelton. I live in the Ellington Park neighborhood, which is accessible from Old Paytonsville Road. I feel a little ill standing here. <laughs> I'm not nearly as prepared as these gentlemen were before me, but I'm mostly standing here because there are a lot of my neighbors um, in the room, and we are concerned that Ellington Park will be a cut through. Because as someone else said, I think in um, your discussion, people avoid traffic lights and when they come flying off of that overpass downhill and turn right into our neighborhood to avoid both the light that would be added at Old Paytonsville and Lewisburg and the light that is at Henpeck and Lewisburg, well, you know you don't have to be going that fast to kill a child. And a lot of our neighbors, both in Berry Farms and in Ellington Park, walk not just to be walking on Paytonsville, but to get to one from one to the other. So I can't see how doing the project and not creating sidewalks on those streets, not doing that second additional part, um, that just seems like a major, major safety hazard. Um, I don't think anybody in our neighborhood is in favor of doing the project, but doing the project and not doing that part of the project seems extra scary. Um, I'm learning a lot tonight, but there are some still some things that I don't necessarily understand. Like, is this mostly about emergency vehicles crossing? Or is this equally about emergency vehicles crossing and citizens having 
a path to get across. Um, I w because if it's only about, if it's mostly about emergency, then I understand why taking that overpass and dumping it into the business district of Dairy, Berry Farms would perhaps not help. I mean, that changes all those numbers that the firemen gave. Um, but that would be a better option for uh, for our neighborhoods to curve that if that's an option land wise. I don't know if that's limited because of land or because of how it's meant to be used. Um, is the, and and I. Is that a two lane pass that goes over? I do think it changed when Creekside Elementary was built, that changes a lot of the need to cross over a lot of cars at one time of day. So um, I think that made a big difference. Not, I, I realize zoning is constantly changing. Um, but you'll be finishing up, please, ma'am. That's all. Thank you. I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate that you're looking ahead and thank you for considering how the residents who have lived there long term in the older neighborhoods and in Newberry Farms would be affected. Hi, I'm Kelly Brown and I'm here tonight as a resident of Ladd Park supporting the Long Lane Overpass as a priority project. I was disappointed to see some of the aldermen that it recommended for the removal of the overpass from the CIP project list. This is especially disappointing for the same aldermen that in 2013 passed a resolution promising TDOT that the Long Lane overpass would be a priority project and funding would be committed in the next several years. Additionally, the project was the only project during the 2019 CIP prioritization that received unanimous support from all aldermen. What has changed since these votes? As chairman of the Ladd Park Political Interest Committee, I was able to participate in the Goose Creek stakeholders meetings. I learned the following developments are already entitled in the Goose Creek area that have not yet been built. 3.3 million square feet of office and retail, over 450 hotel beds, over 2,300 apartments, and over 800 single family homes. Based on these entitled developments, the traffic analysis from the Goose Creek study has the majority of the intersections on Goose Creek failing by 2030. This is just based on the developments already approved, not the thousand acres that has been annexed in and everything else that hasn't gotten improved. Um, you cannot wait until Goose Creek fails before starting construction on the Long Lane overpass. The overpass is to provide a much needed access for local traffic to cross over 65. Having lived on both sides of 65, this overpass will benefit the west side as well as the east side. The new southeast park with the youth sports and the east side with Reams Fleming is gonna have more residents traveling to the east side of the interstate once those are developed. The overpass is to relieve local east-west traffic and not to increase north-south traffic. The residents are already traveling on Lewisburg and Carruthers. I ask you again, what has changed since this was the top CIP project? I urge you to keep this as a top CIP project and finish the project before the costs continue to increase. We've already seen how it's gone from six million to 45. I can't imagine if it keeps getting put off what it'll be in the next 10 years. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Blair. Uh, my wife and I live at 96 Molly Bright Lane in Ladd Park. I'm on the board uh, at Ladd Park. I'm a past president also there in Ladd Park. I want to encourage you to vote for two topics. Um, I'm in favor of the Long Lane Bridge flyover and the Carruthers Parkway pedestrian sidewalk. I feel the safety is the utmost priority with both projects. If safety is a priority in Ward 3, then your vote would potentially save lives. I'll ask you, what's changed since the last time uh, you discussed a long lane flyover? This group voted for and approved this project, even had half the money or some funds um, allocated for this project. So really, what's changed? Well, again, more people, more growth. As Ward 3 is projected now to be more, um, Ward 3 to expand and grow more than any other area in Franklin, this project will be more expensive than originally bid. You promised TDOT that, you would, that if they would install the columns, the city of Franklin would complete the flyover in due time. Well, 10 years <coughs> later, it's time to provide the community a safer east-west corridor. We all know what a mess Highway 96 is and what a mess Goose Creek-Paytonsville Road will be in five years of continued growth in this area. 
This flyover will allow access to Lewisburg Pike, Mac Catcher, and downtown without having to put one more car on Highway 96. If fire and rescue and police can access this end of War 3, saving three seconds up to eight minutes on an emergency call, I can only assume this would save property and lives. Wanting to share a fact with you, the Lad Park Board polled the residents and asked Lad Park residents, are you in favor of the Long Lane flyover? The poll was open for three weeks with just 1,246 homes total in Ladd Park. Uh, we had a little over 400 residents reply. 90% were in favor of this overpass. So again, as I, I think in closing, I think um, as Alderman Potts said earlier, if you build it, they will come. I realize that the projection that the city um, put up on the screen was about 6,000 cars. I think if you take the majority of the cars um, that won't be using Highway 96, I think if you look at the traffic that's going to be coming from the west side, coming east, over to the new city of Franklin's new park that'll be opened up in the next five to seven years, I think your traffic count is probably at least double or triple that amount of cars. I appreciate your time and your efforts and thank you for all that you do for the city of Franklin. Thank you all. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for serving. Your name, please, sir? Clark Miller. Thank I live on sir. Ascot Lane. It's not on this map, but I'll sh try to show you if I had a pointer. This is Warrior Drive. This road runs into Ascot Lane. Ascot Lane bisects Holly Hill, and there's a hook around that you can get to Lewisburg Pike. This road hooks around and hits Lewisburg Pike. Now, being in poorly developed areas and poorly planned areas my entire life and have cities explode like Austin, Texas around me, I understand that development can get ahead of you guys four or five times faster than you guys could get a planning document on the floor. But we open this meeting tonight with one thing, safety. I reviewed all your documents today. Nice packages. This project sounds like a project that got started over 20 years ago that had a purpose. It had a requirement. It was evident in your faces there was a problem. You haven't planned yourselves out of the problem. Now either Goose Creek Parkway overpass meets capacity that without this bridge or doesn't. If you put a fire station over there and you didn't do these response times calculations, whose fault's that? Yours. You have a responsibility to look much into the future you have the best field of visibility, much more than I have. Now, I'm looking at this as new eyes, <clears throat> but that's my business. That's what I do. You haven't said one thing about safety for us. Water will flow in a least path resistance. So Come back to the microphone, traffic, please. They will go up. Come back to the microphone so we okay. get it on record. Water will flow in the path of least resistance, so will traffic. That's the way people are. We're basically lazy when it comes to driving. They're going to take that bypass it right into Warrior Lane, shoot down Warrior, Warrior Lane, T-bone into Ascot Lane, make a hard left, shoot over the bridge. Every one of those houses has new kits. We had a lady leave the subdivision because a car missed the intersection and ended up in her front yard up against her front porch. You haven't addressed safety. Safety is number one. It should be. Not, do I need to spend money, say, somebody gave me 22 years ago, or put my name and say, hey, yeah, we'll do that project. You'll if there's a requirement, state the hard requirements for the project. Money, taxes, flow, safety, put safety on the top of your list. But I am deadly concerned that all the neighborhoods that you're going to affect, we're going to end please, up with sir. a death or a maiming. And I don't want to see it happen. When you put... The park in you start development on that. I stood in the middle of the road on Ascot Mr. Lane. Mr. Miller, thank you for finishing. And your I comment. stopped the trucks thank because you. they were flying. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Laxton, and I appreciate you giving me a minute to speak. I think Maggie, <clears throat> who is my next door neighbor, I didn't know she was going to say anything, but she pretty much summed it up, and so did this gentleman about safety. I'm talking about <laughs> the Paytonsville bypass and it comes right by Ellington Park which all of you know and we're concerned and we know that it will put everybody right through that subdivision 
It'll keep them from making those two lights like Maggie rightly said. But more than that, <clears throat> everybody said it all. So what I'm concerned about, and I don't know why, uh, that we spend more time on trying to make progress and trying to, every one of us in this room are concerned about us and our families and having the type of lifestyle that we had here. And it's just getting worse and worse going off the charts. Soon we'll look like Nashville. You ought to live in India like I did. <laughs> Soon it'll look like India. We all need to ride a, a motorcycle, I guess, when it gets like that. But the point is, is that if we could just spend more time talking about slowing the escalation of what we call progress, I think that it would serve our community and make us stand out a lot better throughout Tennessee. Let them go around, do whatever they want to do. But you have the wonderful position to make those decisions and uh, try and slow it down. Try and look at individual neighborhoods that are here and, and what the impact on it will be. Even Berry Farms can't like it on that particular bypass because rightly said, they'll come in the backside, go through all the houses, trying to get over to Publix or whatever. And there's not a lot of infrastructure and road there in itself. So we've got a problem there and I don't know a thing about the Long Lane project, but I am talking about the Paytonsville Road area and that's gonna be a mess if that goes through. And <clears throat> what's the chances of a plane flying into the Twin Towers again? If you'll go ahead and finish up, please, ma'am. Is about the same as somebody running into that bridge and taking the whole bridge down. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Matt Reginald. I live at 605 Ellington Drive, which is uh, the south end there at Ellington. So this project does abut my property. Um, and I'm also a civil engineer dealing with land development, so I understand what you guys are talking about. Totally understand what we're dealing with as a city, uh, even though I'm a county resident. Um, so I do appreciate it. And as several um, of our aldermen have mentioned, this project will happen. Um, it needs to happen. I understand that. My ask here as a citizen who lives here who has four young children that use this road is that we don't skimp on the safety factor, that we do improve Old Paytonsville um, because we use that road um, to be able to walk over to Berry Farms. Berry Farms has great amenities. We use those. We know several people in Berry Farms that come over and walk in our, our neighborhood. Um, the roads that we have are rural sections. They're not collector roads. So if we start looking at dumping 6,500 cars into that area, it's going to overwhelm the system and it's going to make them unsafe. So my main concern and my ask is that we don't forget that. And while that $45 million price tag is a lot, it has a lot of safety in it. So make sure that we don't forget that part. And we look at all the safety and ca tra traffic calming measures that are needed. So that way we can protect, you know, both county and city residents in this area. So I appreciate y'all's time tonight. Okay, any other comments from the board? You want to move on to item six, please? Which is uh, additional capital projects identified by the Board of Mayor and Alderman. So one of the things we asked the board as we were doing the capital project review is for projects we may not have fully addressed in the menu of projects we gave you. So we wanted to provide an overview of what we heard back from you uh, as just part of the the overall process. And so that's what we wanted to achieve tonight is just walk through what we heard from you and the, at least an initial review from staff in terms of scope of the project in a, in a pretty rough cost estimate, but give you at least a, a order of magnitude of what we think those projects might, uh, how they might impact us. So I'm going to walk you through a quick presentation of the projects you've requested to be added, uh, some that be added that were already projects into the CIP and others that you wanted added for consideration. Uh, Eric, Jonathan, please chime in if I uh, miss anything as I go. You want to ask? Yeah. So, I know we're going to lose Alderman Brown, so the question yeah. is, is there anything in particular you'd like to address? Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so before we get into the CIP initial projects, I wanted to brief you on TDOT's 10-year plan, what that means, what it looks like, and help you understand that, because obviously 
it does have an impact on uh, what we decide to fund at a local level. Uh, and then we can go through the additional projects that are being requested in that CIP. So uh, TDOT's 10-year plan, essentially the General Assembly as part of the Transportation Modernization Act, uh, is investing about $3.3 billion. And with that additional investment, it caused them to take a comprehensive look at how they're prioritizing and how they're delivering. So one of the things that you'll see in their 10-year plan is they're down to about 100 some projects in that 10-year plan. Uh, they looked at the list they had before of 1,000 and realized we're spending a tremendous amount of money designing projects that aren't getting completed. Uh, and they said we need to focus in on what we actually want to build and then it's on now sorry they want to focus on what needs to be built and focus on those projects only um, and, and and not just bounce around from project to project and so that's what TDOT has essentially done which I agree with and think is a, a good approach uh, so looking at their 10-year plan they have 1.2 billion in their annual work program plus the 3.3 billion as part of the transportation or transportation modernization act minus 300 million that goes directly to the counties Get you to about 15 billion dollars in that next 10-year plan, uh, and plus another six billion for multimodal. So, what what made the plan in the in Williamson County? Because none of them are actually in the city of Franklin, other than I-65. Is they're looking at uh, State Route 6. They've had it in two projects, but I'm going to just talk about it as one project. Uh, the the estimated construction year is the same on both, but essentially it's from Duplex Road. Uh, to just north of Tollgate Boulevard is the one project that got funded. And it, it is a regionally significant project, but it is not located in the city of Franklin. The one that is located in the city of Franklin is um, the I-65 corridor priority investment project. Uh, what has been eye-opening to me is that that's, that's, the, that's all the projects. Unless they get additional funding, um, that's all the projects that are getting funded in the next 10 years. Now, similar to us, like projects such as Carlisle Lane, you know, they're gonna revisit this plan every year. So projects later on that 10 year, I could see them changing their mind on or, or removing from that 10 year uh, planning horizon or reevaluating priorities. They're also gonna look at, continue to look at the uh, statewide partnership program, which is where we submitted on Mac Hatcher Southeast um, asked to contribute about five million dollars to that project. They're continuing to, to look for local partnership funding, uh, additional general fund transfers that they may have, um, or direct appropriations from the feds. But essentially every year, and last year we did it in August, I'm gonna assume that they're gonna do it about that time this year. And, and this whole local funding partnership component is, um, pretty much a black box at this stage. We don't really have a sense of how that will work or what moves the needle on that. Uh, we had been hopeful with $5 million put into Mac Hatcher Southeast that it might get us there. It did not. We know of at least a couple other communities that put something to the tune of 20 to $30 million into projects that did not get funded. So there's not a magic number or percentage that we've at least been given guidance on, and maybe that'll develop over time, that would say, if we did this, we would get certain projects done or moved up the list. So it is uh, something we're trying to learn more about. Uh, there's been a, there's not been a lot of direction given on what, where that goes, what that's like. Our team's been in communication to try to understand better and look at alternatives and ways that we could address needs on state routes to, to address these very uh, topics we've been talking about tonight. So this is something that continues to evolve. The state has changed its uh, philosophical approach, if you will, to one of preparing many projects and then funding them funding as they come to, to when they commit to it, they commit to it, it's gonna get built. But you see, it's been reduced. It's one-tenth of what was on their list previously. So it's just a totally different structure and it's one we still are, are trying to learn about and uh, you know, we'll, keep, we'll keep working it. But um, I, I wish we could give you something more definitive about what might happen if we did you know, X, Y would happen. We just don't know that at this stage and, and hope to learn a little and more project, as this evolves. The projects you saw listed on, on 31, US 31, shown as two projects now, actually were originally one project. So those are two projects now. So originally it was from Duplex Road in, in Murray County and Spring Hill 
all the way up to Tollgate Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Now that's broken into two projects. So, and you can see the the, pro the estimated project expense too is about three hundred million dollars, and that's basically widening a two and three lane roadway to five lanes, essentially, and and median, you know, so. That's how much that's expected to be, and that's you're looking at estimated construction year would be 2033. So it's the end of the 10-year plan. So, and that's that's been Spring Hill's big want now for Many 20 years. years. Spring Hill's gotten a lot yes, of things, they have. And and it, Spring Hill has also created a lot of their issues too. <laughs> as, as someone who lives there, I can I can attest to that. <laughs> this is a. The, real quick, before we leave this and go into the actual project, but I think this is one thing when folks ask what's changed. This is what has, on it, for me, I can speak for myself, this is one thing that has really changed the way I've been thinking about our capital projects because are we moving into an environment where the state, what, what kind of environment are we moving into with our TDOT funding on our major corridors? And yes, like, yes, Ward 3 has mostly TDOT roads going through it, but downtown, all of our major thoroughfares are TDOT. Like we, and so that's why I think that is one major thing that's changed um, is that we're, we're signing up for a 10 year plan that we plan to keep, but we don't know what we're gonna get from TDOT. Yeah. It's, and and it's, yeah. It's, 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 it's a worthy question, and, uh, but that's what one thing that has changed. And if we would be, not be doing our job if we didn't think about these kinds of big ticket items when we have this kind of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to start running through the projects. Um, obviously, this one, Goose Creek Bypass, Carruthers Parkway Extension, was included. I'm assuming what an alderman is asking is for this to be uh, potentially funded. Four-star priority project, it uh, pr provides connectivity of major arterial roadways. The Goose Creek area is a short-term growth area. Uh, the improvements will support existing and proposed developments along Carruthers. Uh, we've not... We've not really pushed this project, but I do think funding, we will need funding at some point when development comes forward with this. Uh, in my opinion, the cheapest way to do this type of project is gonna be to do it in conjunction with a development. Mm -hmm. It substantially uh, reduces earthwork, right away acquisition, easement acquisition, uh, but it is a, it is, is a four-star project in our opinion. And as, as, as Paul said, that a, de a development <coughs> component will likely push this forward. The next one, we heard a little bit about this, uh, is a sidewalk project along Carruthers Parkway. Well, I do agree that safety is extremely important. Uh, the majority of the project options associated with this are throwaway. There, are, We have a technical memo about this that you can dive into the different options. High level, I'll say that the option we're showing here is the non-throwaway option, which is essentially pave an additional lane and stripe out an area to walk. That would be the one I would personally recommend and support only because you'd invest $1.5 million and you wouldn't throw it away. You'd essentially build that additional lane. The other two options, uh, while cheaper, would be a paved path at about $550,000 $550, and uh, a concrete sidewalk at about $1.3 million. But those second two options would be 100% throw away. Um, so that's why I threw out the 1.5 yeah. option. That would move up on my list only because it would be a permanent improvement. Paul, yeah. throw away because we will be expanding that road. That's correct. It's actually correct. in the it's in the footprint of the new road, future roadway widening. So Oxford Glen Drive again. This is another important project. Uh, we estimated about 1.1 million dollars. Uh, our honest opinion is that this would go up in priority if we could work with the HOAs to to look to dedicate the right of way and easements. Now they don't control all of it, but they would control a substantial amount of it. It is definitely a connection that's needed, especially as McEwen is extended, which is happening, and the multi-purpose trail will be on McEwen as well and help provide connectivity from McKay's Mill area up to McEwen. Can I add Paul. something? Uh, Can I add something to that? Mr. Mayor, may I add ahead, something please. to that? Um, I think that's yeah, your project. And I've also, <laughs> also been talking with the HOA so I think that $400,000 might not be in there because they own that property, but they maintain that property and they mow that hill. So if we put a sidewalk in there, they may be willing to work with us and let us do that if we would take over mowing the hill next to the sidewalk, which is not that much. Uh, I mean, it is a, a, 
a bit, but it's not astronomically large. And and um, <clears throat> then the development down at the base of the hill at the roundabout is uh, Avalon Village. And once that com coming, once that's coming on, we're going to have some fees that are being paid there, and they may be able to help us out with with that sidewalk as well. And also, some of the fees could go into that sidewalk and reimburse ourselves for doing the project. So we have a couple of things there that could greatly reduce that cost. And, and we have people walking on the street, and it's a hill, and it's curves. People can't see the people on the streets. Not only walkers, but we have runners, but we have, I just don't know how they do it. They have kids and everybody walking on that road. And it's, it's not safe, and we have a lot of traffic. And, and with uh, Village of Babylon coming on board uh, soon, probably in the next year or so, starting some construction there, depending on the market again, because everybody's sort of waiting on the market. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that cost could be reduced. Yes, absolutely. Thank Alden you. Potts, I'm going to let you make a quick comment before they continue. On. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate that because my computer is spinning right now. <laughs> if you would take us back one slide for just a minute. And when you mentioned right of way on this project right here, I know I've already partnered up with the Ladd Park uh, HOA president with Amanda Orn on this. They, they do want to move forward with right of way and ha have provided a letter of agreement for the city to move this project forward as well. Yes, great point. Uh, I don't think we'll need any right away. We may, None. but mm -hmm. we perked, what, what happened was when we built Carruthers, we built it out for the four lane, so we should be good. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in that letter too, they off, they agreed that the removal of the landscaping and Correct. irrigation be which would be very helpful and reduce the cost. Okay, good. So, okay. Uh, Boyd Mill Avenue, this is actually one of the first projects I worked on and when I came to the city of Franklin as well. We actually acquired right away for 90% of this project, uh, but essentially about a $10.4 million price tag associated with this. And really what it is is the, these different subdivisions and residents, they want to get to the park system, they want to get to West Haven. Uh, we are working with Franklin Green to do a sidewalk connection potentially over to West Haven that's a, much shorter than this project. We're going to continue to look at that. Uh, this project could be phased. There's a phasing memo that was provided in your packets. Essentially, you could build from where Southern Land is ending, which is north of Franklin Green, where this red line starts. They're actually improving from that point to Highway 96. So you could phase it and build from there to the Franklin Green entrance, and then a second phase, Franklin Green to Downs Boulevard, or vice versa. It just depends on are you trying to get to the trail on 96 in West Haven or are you trying to get to the soccer fields. But there are phasing options available with this. We did look at accident counts on this section of road, which were below the statewide average. So safety didn't really justify an immediate improvement when we compared it. But it's definitely a roadway that needs to be improved. And the majority of the, the, the crashes were at the intersections. Correct. Can, can I, can this was one, one thing that I brought up and uh, because of the neighborhood that's here most of them wearing green uh, a lot of them wearing green so thank you all for coming out um would you the half width so just not to go i don't want to go through everything but if we were to take half or half width construction from franklin green to the neighborhood to boyd mill that's 2.3 when you say half half width just so those that maybe weren't on the call that we had what kind of it would be the south half of the road for the rest of all it would be the south half of boyd mill south half of boyd mill correct it'd be the whole south half of the road including a sidewalk including the sidewalk curb and gutter drainage because we'd have to do something sure with the ditch and there's a big parcel of undeveloped land there and who knows and, and when that happened they would do fix their portion so that's why we do the south half correct and so essentially you'd still see it it'd still be a two-lane roadway because we, we wouldn't have enough width to really widen sure. the roadway you'd have a, a an extra lane well, you'd have the same lineage there you'd have a little bit of a paved shoulder you'd have the curb and gutter drainage and you'd have a sidewalk and that's from the 2.3 million dollar half width option from where southern land is starting now the southern land's going to go all the way down there to that 886 that 886 feet right southern land's going to this point right here which is Show that's what the that's the end of the red line on the this okay. yeah so they're okay. going to that oh, and they've already put, built a whole lot of uh housing up there just very yeah, yeah. Oh, recently absolutely. yeah they're 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 going like gangbusters up they there are right uh -huh. so if we were to get start there at that red line half width to to uh boyd mill how much is that five million no 
No, it's from on Boyd Mill to, to, the, to, to no, no, not all the way to Downs. Are we just talking about going to Franklin Green? Yeah, can you explain what you're going to? You're going from Southern Land to Downs Boulevard. I, I don't want to speed up Southern Land's piece. Like, let them build that, but stop. Start where Southern Land's going to stop, and then go all the way mm -hmm. to Downs. Yeah. Just the half. Just the half. Just the half. Roughly half of that cost. Yeah, roughly half. That five cost. million. Yeah, yeah, five. I just wanted Alderman to hear that. I don't know. I think the residents are more concerned with getting a sidewalk as soon as possible. Necessarily having two sides on both sides. You know, we'll take what we can get. Um, Five million. Okay, thank you. So that would be though from Franklin Green. Uh, what I guess north. That'd be the north? entire red line there, southern entire section. Entire red road. line. Just Correct. Side, just the south yeah, it's side. It's a little confusing. Okay. The entire red line, just the south side. And you leave the other one so other that, side of the road, so just that, the open ditch, and. But so that would go all the way to Downs. Correct. But you still got to make the improvements in the intersection of Downs and Boyd Mill, then. Yeah, we would. Probably so it doesn't cut the cost in half. It'll cut some, but it shouldn't cut it in half. It'll be a You've little harder. You've got wooden poles in there that your good friend Dave Parker put in there <laughs> 10 years ago. I remember that boat. Me remember that hanging boat. Hanging it on a wire. Yep, hanging on a wire. He so, called them temporary. Temporary. <laughs> that was temporary 10 years ago, whatever it was. So it doesn't probably does not cut it in half. It's, it's we probably. can actually relocate the wood poles, so they can actually stay. I mean, it wouldn't yeah. it wouldn't drastically change no. that cost a lot. I have, I, we would work with you on options. We'd probably I have no the intersection the to be done with it. I think what I'd like to just say as we're going through this is just, and, and we can move on to some other, other projects, but I don't think anyone is wanting to do the full ten point four million now. So as we're looking at these and prioritizing, really we're wanting to get a sidewalk for safety from Franklin Green to Boyd Mill, or excuse me, the Downs. So, and that's all I'll say. So, so I mean, could I ask? Are they talking about walking from Franklin Green over to Downs? It, it would that get both you, ways. Okay. That would get you to Downs. We would put a crosswalk in across Downs. We would okay, signalize to go, to go that. To the things down. Yeah, they're trying to get the Jim Warren gotcha. Park, the gotcha. Williamson County gotcha. Rec Center. Downtown. Yes. Downtown. Mm. All right, keep rolling. All right, this is the other project, and this is something. I'd at least like to move forward with a planning to even see if it's feasible. But as an alternative to widening all of Southeast MacAcher, TDOT did a plan back in the day to look at what if we just beef up the intersections, which some people like, some people hate, but it'll definitely get traffic through that intersection. Is essentially you get double through lanes through the intersection, you get double left turn lanes where needed, and you simply do intersection projects and then they do neck down into some people will call it a bottleneck but it, mm -hmm. it will push those cars through and what it could possibly do is delay an 80 million dollar project and get it down to a 13 million dollar project so something we could definitely study look at look at how long that type of an improvement would last and potentially look to submit on the statewide partnership program for versus the full 80 million dollar project and at the very least, when they do come through and, and do the whole MacAcher project, at least the majority of your side road work is done at that point. Correct. Mm -hmm. So there's less intrusive to the side roads. Yeah. It, it, it would help it. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is, an, this is a no-brainer here. This has to be done. The intersection at Lewisburg and MacAcher seems like it's the easier of the two based on our previous conversations. And for those that weren't in the conversations, the larger investment is actually having to cut through the rock wall that that's is correct. right there by the YMCA and uh, Forest Crossing. That's so correct. that's what we're really dealing with, and that's where the majority of the expense is. So if we had to prioritize the project, we could easily go ahead and do MacHatcher and Lewisburg first and then address the other piece of that. You could. I would argue we need to just do them both. Uh -huh. Need to do them we both. Push I'm, I'm not saying yeah. not to do them both. <laughs> you go I'm just saying put one morning. A and one I'll B. I'll make it to the other one. Well, the yes, thing sir. is, how much is the traffic, though, whenever at Royal Oaks going into there? That is just a... It's, it's bad. I mean, it's yeah. really yeah. bad. So, so put the, keeping this in perspective, if you leave Polk Place and you drive through those intersections right there and you get to Highway 96, it will take you just as long to drive from, uh, or excuse me, up to 65. It will take you just as long to drive from 65 to Vanderbilt University <laughs> to the medical center. <laughs> so that that's the change that we're talking about right here. Next project is uh, Eddie Lane. Uh, obviously with the factory district coming online, these residents have been asking for sidewalk for many years. You got the sidewalk on State Route 96, that'll get you into downtown to Pinkerton Park. 
We estimate this at about $11 million. That's uh, building it as a three-lane roadway. This one also could be potentially phased. I think my initial judgment was at Fork Ranger Drive is would be a good phasing location just due to topography. I don't know if you do the north side first or the south side first, but roughly it would be 30% from Fork Ranger. I'll show you on the map. Up to Liberty, and that uh, also would include where Franklin Special School District is putting their office and their uh, bus, all their buses will be uh, long term, or whether you do the south side with all the residential section to try to get them down to 96 Pinkerton Park and downtown Franklin, which is about 70% uh, of that project cost. Do go ahead, Alderman okay. Peters. Well, you know, this this is a, a definitely been wanted for a long time by a lot of people, but it has a lot of problems there that you do not see in anywhere else because part of it is that it's got that Middle Tennessee Electric substation there, and I mean you got all those wires, and I mean they're not going to be you know once they get across. They, they, we put them under, uh, underground, you know, in, in my subdivision and everything. But there's no way you can put those huge uh, wires. I mean, the, the, they, they carry so much electricity that you can't really do anything about yes, that. Yes, ma'am, those are transmission mains. They are, they're really transmission yeah. mains, you're right. But the other thing is, uh, you know, they've got all those light poles there. Well, you know, the other day somebody ran into one of them and it, they had to close the, the road down and everything. But but what I'm trying to say is if you go, if you drive down that and really look at how is it going to be possible to make that a three-lane road and... And, and the sidewalk, yes, that's right. I mean, I think they'd rather have the sidewalk than the three-lane road. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's really something to think about. Yeah, I mean, we could that's definitely look at a two-lane road with just a sidewalk. I mean, it'll, it'll save you 12 feet of impact, but I think no matter what you do, you're going to be needing to do... You'll be looking at turn lanes curbing, at the intersections. But. Yeah, turn lanes at the intersections, you're going to have to oh, curb at the Oh, at, at the intersections, I can understand that. You'd have to curb and gutter it for sure. Otherwise, in that residential area, you're going to be getting way up in people's front yards. That's true. Um, That's a good so point. have to balance some of that. Put point. So we, once we start to touch it, we pretty much have to deal with any drainage issues that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we're, you know, we're kind of bound to deal with that once we're there. So, well, let me ask you: How has the um, Franklin Special School District, uh, you know, building out there, made a difference? Because they've done a lot of work, and you could almost get sidewalk somewhere. They're adding a temporary sidewalk that'll get removed. And they're substantially improving the drainage. Um, I wouldn't yes, say they're permanent agree. improvements, so they have to be removed long term uh, when we curb and gutter everything. But they are making some pretty big improvements. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought too. But as I, I say, that's not a that's not simple. I mean, it, it's not going. There's there's no easy way. We've got Alderman Barnhill and then uh, Alderman Bag. There's some sidewalks out there now. It's, it's they, very piecemeal. Uh, yes, okay. there are some. So you could ex you would extend those, or would you be able, would you be able to use those, or are they highly unlikely that we? They, they, it's unlikely they would be in the right place to actually That's fit in that segment, unless you start to try to piecemeal the road together, and it would be terrible. Yeah. And that's something we could look at when we're out there designing is whether the roadway actually makes sense to be three lanes. Right now, we're just going with what our standard would be to go to a three lane section. When we're actually doing a design, we can look at that closer to in detail, whether it needs to be three lanes. That's right. Wouldn't the project be less in its entirety than it would if we piecemeal the thing together? So it looks, it looks like we would want to go ahead and finish something, whether it's this or whether it's uh, Boyd Mill or whether it's uh, some other project or whatever, looks like we'd want to go ahead and finish something rather than piecemeal it and trying to work out a couple of million dollars here and three million dollars there and 11 million dollars here. I mean, I, you know, I think that project right there has been on the back burner for years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. years. So I mean, I, you know, I'd do the if it's three lanes and you recommend it in the sidewalk i think you probably that's the route that that's the route that i would go on that right there 
They might have to do something else on some of the others, and I don't think you can trade off uh, one project for another and a bridge, one bridge for one place and one bridge for some other place then. I think you've got to look at it, at it, and whichever one we think is the priority, that's the one we've got to go with then. Yeah, the other item I'd say about this is both bridges over top in a flood event, and there's zero access to these residential units. It is, yep. it is, not, a, it is not a great situation in a flood. Alderman Baggett, you have a comment before we keep moving on? Yeah, talk about safety. Flood event, you can't get to any of these houses. We'll get the firefighters back up here. We'll talk about that and on, on this one, <laughs> uh, you know, if we're going that route. But uh, the reason I put the, I put Eddie Lane, excuse me. I have safety too. Yeah, yeah. We all have it. Uh, the reason I, I put uh, legacy street projects is my, was my additional CIP it was Boyd Mill, Eddie Lane and Old Liberty because like Alderman Barnhill just said, these kind of get left behind. We had a pretty decent shot at getting Eddie Lane done about a year and a half ago, two years, when there was a proposal, a development proposal on that was overwhelmingly, uh, you know, again, the neighborhoods were overwhelmingly against this multifamily development there, but would have probably pr yep. propelled this to the top of, uh, you know, our list. You know, with the pressures we have now and the amount of traffic that's going to become in the factory district, like at some point we got to say, let's do this. And that's why I think these these Boyd Mill, Eddie Lane, and Old Liberty found out. I think we can do some adjustments. We'll talk about that next. But um, but we got to do something here. And we're if we're all un unified at Carlisle coming off, then I think this the money can start working and looking at some of these other things too. But the neighborhood is some of them may be here too tonight. I know son, maybe not. Uh, they were supposed to be, but uh, they have emailed incessantly about this and called and texted and they've been waiting for years to have some kind of access outside of here and they're so close and this street is dangerous. It is, it is, it is actually very dangerous when you're driving down there and this is old country road and it, and there's lots of hilltops. So I, I ask that we strongly consider this. Mr. Baggett. I put your phone number on the theater marquee. Yes. Just to help out your residence. You know, there was a couple that called me. I think that I think they found it. I think they found it without your help. But that's good. To so Lewisburg Pike and uh, Donaldson Creek Parkway, this intersection is 80% designed, ready for construction. Uh, we're just waiting on funding. There is no easements and right away. Now that the design's done, we know that and we actually have lowered the costs in our annual budget based on. Uh, construction. I want to say it was about six hundred fifty thousand dollars. This is one I think engineering also put in as a capital project option within the operating budget too, mm -hmm. just to kind of okay. keep an option open with these that are not quite as expensive, but also might get lost in the shuffle of the larger project. So it's it's got kind of two potential uh, options just because it it is a less than a million dollar project. Similar scale. We do so would you just repeat what you think the the completion date will be? It, I mean, it takes eight months to order a signal pole, so... Actually, that's come down dramatically. I would say about a year. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. If it's come down then, <laughs> about a year. Come, come down. It all depends on how... It's not a big project. Once they deliver the materials, it's going to go pretty quick. Yeah. It all Good. depends on that material. Because the turn lines are pretty much in out there. I mean, you've got the width there, right. so it's, it's this is not a huge, huge project. Okay. So 950 is kind of like... Yeah, it's yeah, about 650. Because there was no right of way it, needed in this. It's about 650 at this point. Yeah. Okay. Is what we put in the yeah. enhancement request. Okay. Keep going. Uh, Old Liberty Pike um, essentially improves safety here. There's obviously parking issues on this street with the church and residents. Um, uh, we did get a lot of phone calls about neighborhood traffic calming on this section of road. We put one option here. There's a technical memo yeah, that goes along with it. Well. So. The options were essentially two 11 foot lanes with parallel parking and a side and a five foot sidewalk. I will tell you, I know there are parking issues associated with the church. I know that church does a really good job trying to manage it the best they can. The other option was to just look at, uh, so that with the parking was about 5.7 million. We looked at one, which was two 11 foot lanes and a sidewalk, which is what you're seeing here at 4.24 million. The last option was no curb and gutter, two 11 foot lane improvement with drainage and a sidewalk. We put that at about 2.5 million. Essentially that gets them a sidewalk. 
Um, the question is how far up into the yards do we end up having to get? How, how many drain, how much drainage improvements do you have to make? Uh, the last option was looking at traffic calming. Ultimately, it didn't, it didn't qualify for it because a 85th percentile speed was 29 miles per hour on this roadway. One mile, one mile under the yeah. one mile under the tr threshold. Correct. One mile. So, but it doesn't meet volumes either. Understood. I think uh, just an update. The neighbor, this came after in middle eight kind of discussions and really concern with the uh, old, old Liberty Pike and and a promise that would follow through on on figuring out options and we've done that. Uh, what I'm hearing now is that they'd like to move forward with the neighborhood traffic calming and see how that works and then we can. Um, evaluate the, the improvements so uh, at, a, at a later time uh, but I think that's a I mean what staff did to help educate the the community and I got their signatures here for the neighborhood traffic on me I know it doesn't qualify but uh, I was told that we could as BOMA could do the neighborhood traffic calming proactively that's kind of our standards we set but we can always go ahead and so I think that might be a good uh, workaround and, and this these larger numbers won't be uh, We'll have to consider those right now. What what would you consider for traffic calming? I think it's a speed. speed it was a it was a speed you hump. Do speed cushions yeah. here. Cushions. So. I, mean, that, I mean, that's really all you can do here. We've done that on some other streets. We've street. done that on other streets. Okay. We'd probably do the enhanced signage and speed cushions would be my guess. We'd let Adam figure out what he wants to do here. But yeah, if you want to send us a petition, we'll bring that forward under your name and to present and implement. All right, next item is Mac Hatcher Northwest Bridge. We're estimating about 41 million <coughs> on the bridge. We essentially took what it cost to do the other bridge and inflated it to today's values. It's about a half mile bridge, extremely expensive. Uh, it's definitely needed. You'll see a huge right of way cost because- The easements will be bad. Of, uh, we, have to re we have to reacquire uh, construction, construction easements to access the bridge. They do not exist to get underneath. So we estimate that about yeah. 2.5, but happy to answer questions. My question is, is kind of um, not super important, but since that bridge is already named, an additional lane would keep the naming in place, correct? Yeah. It wouldn't change that. Yeah. Just <laughs> check in. We don't need another state rep on the other side. No, we don't. <laughs> Unless you want one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's been my hour. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> uh, this one, um, unfortunately, Alderman Brown's not here, was Jackson Lake, and I don't know how much he knows on the history of it. It's about a. <laughs> it's about 11.5 acre lake. Uh, we dredged it in 2000, from 2011 to 2014 at a cost of 1.7 million. Uh, it, the lake is intended for the sole use of the residents. If you look at signage, the HOA did approach us. We did look at some options. There are no great options to resolve this. This is very similar to Liberty Hills Lake. Either we are going to continuously dredge it or the HOA is going to continually dredge it, or we're going to convert it to a stream. I, I do not know of a, I do not know of a, they, they approach us about a potential four bay. We've asked multiple consulting firms if they've ever done something like this before and they don't even know if they could permit it they don't know if it's feasible and it would be an extremely expensive project to try to undertake and extremely um, hideous even the ones that were similar to it so it's it's basically a, a smaller pre-treatment pond so on, on any of our detention ponds you have the main pond and you have a smaller uh kind of a an inlet area with stone or some sort of area that's meant to catch all the initial debris that comes out of the inlet pipe that's easier to clean all of that out of the problem here is it's in this is an inline pond so the stream actually runs through the pond is the problem so no matter what hits in that in the four bay if you were to construct one the water continually just flows over and pushes it back in so it would actually be constant maintenance and and we there's actually we we were given a kind of a sort of example some something similar they did one of our consultants did over in north carolina but it was basically an entire concrete structure you could drive into mm -hmm. it was terrible looking you would not want it look an industrial complex mm -hmm. you would not want to live next to it you would not want to see it you would see it from satellite <laughs> photographs if, it was terrible if this was something the board wanted to move forward with we would need to do some preliminary studies to even see what is feasible and engage permitting agencies because i'm not sure we could I'm not sure there's much we can do other than dredge it but based, or convert to a stream. Based upon the experience two or three years ago, 
your time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, all that. That's that was too good. <laughs> Based upon what we experienced in 2011 to 2014, I am not going to be real particularly happy about doing too much on that lake. We, we, we spent might be the case. enormous amount of time and oh, money and dredging it and pulling transmissions yeah. out and pulling wire out. And uh, yeah, it was in, a mess. In we defense of Alderman Brown, I don't know that he just asked because an HOA yeah. asked to put this on. I don't know that he knew the background or the options he was and, just And we appreciate that the HOA member that came to us for this, it was, I believe it was the president of the That's HOA. Good. And he was, yeah, and, and he um, was trying to be yeah. proactive about it. So sure. I, I do appreciate that, that comment before it got to be a bad situation. We used to tease in a little internal joke. We used to tease Eric about getting excommunicated from his church over the- They're trying to make it Friday. possible. I didn't have anywhere to go to church for a while. So. <laughs> Hold on, Potts. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. I do have three speaker cards on this, so go ahead. I just- Good. Telling you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just had a clarifying question. Did you say, as you were saying the word dredge, I heard we dredge, city of Franklin dredge? No. And one, Thank you for well, clarifying. Well, no, we yes. didn't do it, but we, we contracted. We contracted it. Right. So at one point, we, we declared a bunch of lakes as regional lakes. That's where I'm going. And we were starting to dredge some of those yes. lakes. Yes. This was the second or first. I know we did Liberty Hills once, and yeah. they were wanting it again, and we agreed on the stream. We did Liberty Hills first. We did. Then we did Jackson Lake, and now they're sure here did. back wanting it again, which just shows. And we did that analysis where we showed the cost to try to do this every 10 years. That's why I wanted to revisit this, because if I remember correctly, you had a presentation that had like uh, maybe 12 to 16 slides in it. Yes. And walked us through every single one. And we said we were not going to go down this slippery slope. Yes. Yep. Yep. Right? Yes. Okay. Just making sure. I, All in burger. I went through both of those. <laughs> so we did Liberty Hills and then we did Jackson Lake, which was a total nightmare because we ran into all these problems. That was Eric, Eric's baptism by fire or by, by water, I guess, again, when he got here because that was our big project. And uh, I will tell you, people buy those homes on that water up there and they pay more money to be on the water. I don't think they're going to be in like Liberty Hills. They're not going to want to take that lake out. So, but that's a small development. You're not talking thousands of houses there and they won't be able to afford it. So we're going to have to figure something out there. I don't know what the answer is. And I'm glad they put that. Sorry, Bob, if you're listening at home. <laughs> He's the HOA. Yeah. But, you know, it's um, it's Alderman Brown's now. It used to be mine. And uh, it, it is, it, it's nothing we should take lightly, but it's, it's going to be. It's going to be tough, and I, I don't know if we can come up with anything. It took four years working with Liberty Hills to get to where we are. We can continue to work with the HOA to work with them on what potential options are. And they work great. They're just trying to find a solution. Yeah, and the people there are great. Yeah. All right, we've got uh, three speakers, uh, Tom Murray, Chris Meese, and Jenny Williamson, if they'll line up. And uh, you have two minutes each. That's a fight y'all have to fight. <laughs> uh, my name is Tom Murray. I've uh, been a property owner in Franklin Green for 18 years. Former law enforcement and a real estate agent as well. Uh, father of three children who all went through Wilco schools since pre-K through 12th. Now they're 23, 21, and 17. Um, also a member of the Independence High School Hall of Fame as a coach. Uh, in football, that just means I'm active in my community and like to give back. So I just wanted to share about this, the, the sidewalk proposal, obviously the one closest to me um, is the Franklin Green one. Um, I just, I, as a real estate professional, I see a need for walkability. People love downtown Franklin and access to it. And uh, this is one project in particular, I think that would help with that. But the more important thing uh, comes to me as a former deputy sheriff uh, is the safety factor. Um, during my time as a deputy, uh, I was on scene for seven fatal accidents, two of which were car versus pedestrian and car versus cyclist. And I had to be the one to make the knock on the door to let them know that a family member had passed uh, due to an accident. So 
Back in 2007 on that corner of Downs Boulevard and Boyd Mill, there was a fatal accident. And that's why we have a traffic light there. And I don't know, some people uh, are new to the neighborhood and maybe don't know that, but I was there that day as well. Um, so basically, I just wanted to say that, you know, Franklin Green, my kids grew up there. They learned to ride bicycles in the neighborhood, but they were never allowed to leave the neighborhood because of the safety factor. Um, lots of people want to go over to those ball fields, thousands of kids playing soccer. It's just something that's been needed for a long, long time. And uh, if we keep putting projects off, there's always an emergency, there's always the next one. But the residents of Franklin Green since 2001 have been really wanting this. And I really think it's time that we make it a priority and just make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Chris Meese. Um, I live in Franklin Green. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to say anything that we haven't discussed today. I, I think, you know, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I believe that this is a safety issue. I've lived in, um, I'm a native New Orleanian. I've lived in uh, Nashville for a little over 10 years, arguably the best place to raise a family in this country. Um, this was, all, this got on my radar because I almost struck a child that was riding his bike down Boyd Mill right before Christmas. And I don't know why he was riding his bike on Boyd Mill. Uh, to this gentleman's point, children should not ride their bikes or walk on that street. Um, and so, you know, I've kind of made this a point. I appreciate Patrick Baggett's support. You know, number one, it's a safety issue. It just is. And we certainly do not want to ever be in a position to say, I told you so. And neither would we if, if something tragic were to happen. But secondly, something that we discussed, and I appreciate Eric Stuckey's support and these gentlemen's support on our call that we had with our HOA. Um, it's, it's kind of a, an embarrassing situation. Our children are less than a mile from school, can't get there without getting on the bus or getting in a car. Um, we can't get to the soccer fields. We can't get to the baseball fields. We can't get to, we can't get to downtown Franklin. This is almost a 30 year old neighborhood um, from, from my understanding. I mean, and it sounds like this has been on the docket for quite some time. And I just implore this group to really just, you know, number one, we'd love to have a sidewalk on Boyd Mill. But secondarily, if you all could get grant us access to Perry Creek Elementary, it's less than a mile from our from our homes uh, and, and give us the ability to get to 96 or to Downs Boulevard so that we can enjoy this beautiful part of 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 uh, Nashville and, and of Tennessee. It would it would just be it would mean a lot and uh, our neighborhood would much appreciate it. So thank you much. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good afternoon. Me, you can get to the soccer fields from Franklin Green. You would have to go no, through no, what? You can't. No, no, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. No, no. You cannot. <laughs> I would, I would never allow my children to try to make it to those soccer fields from our home. Well, you come through Willow Springs. Willow Springs, take uh, the soccer fields are right on the soccer fields right on the How side. How did you get from Willow Springs to the yeah. soccer fields? They're there. They're all you. You have to cross Horton. You'd have to cross Horton, but you're going to have to cross something like this. I don't have any objections. I think we need to do the sidewalks in the one yeah, street of the road. Not, what you're proposing is not a solution. To this well, it, it is a solution. I just want to make myself perfectly clear. And I made mine perfectly clear yeah, too. Perfect but. Hey, we'll agree and disagree. We'll, we'll agree to disagree. That's not a solution. Okay, we're going to keep moving on with the public comments. Go ahead, Ms. Williamson. Hi, I'm Jenny Williamson. I live at 3148 Langley, Langley Drive in Franklin Green. Uh, first, I'd like to say that uh, Franklin Green is, we got 497 homes in here. So a nice community. Uh, I live there with my husband and my 21 month year old. So we really enjoy that community a lot. Uh, currently, there's zero pedestrian connectivity outside of this neighborhood. Uh, where we have no sidewalks, especially in Boyd Mill, uh, no shoulders on the road whatsoever. Uh, so we're not really walking anywhere. There was a comment mentioned for um, going at Willow Springs. Uh, one weekend, we did take our bike trailer, put our infant in it, and went to downtown Franklin. You cannot make it. There's no sidewalks continuously that go there. So we had to put Daddy in back. Hopefully, if they hit him, they won't hit us. And then we had to kind of really boogie it to get to Jim Warren. So there's no continuous sidewalk from Franklin Green to Jim Warren Park, maybe to like the two sidewalks or the two soccer fields, but that's it. That's the only connectivity you have. So, you know, you're not doing anything beyond that. 
Um, so a couple things we have. We have that beautiful multimodal right off of Mac Hatcher. Uh, we got another one right off uh, you know, 96 that goes down to downtown. Uh, we got Jim Warren Park. Big thing is West Haven. When I say it, when they say that the elementary school is close to Franklin Green, 1,200 feet. We can't get to it. So it's very, very close. Uh, so you have to get in a car, drive two miles in a car to get there. There's also daycare in there. That's where we take ours. I'd love to take her in the bike trailer, but that's not going to happen, <laughs> you know, near future. Um, one thing, too, once I decided to ride my bike to work uh, down to North McEwen, seven miles. I'm done road bikes. That's nothing. Uh, so I decided to go Franklin Green and then take a left to get on multimodal to Mac Hatcher. I got on that little segment and very quickly I decided that was an extremely stupid idea. So I'm there, I'm like, I hope I don't die. Wow, okay. Um, so I got there and, you know, made it. And this is like an adult who's thinking, wow, this is not safe. I have done thousands of miles on a road bike. I used to commute when I lived in up, Orlando please. in multi lane highways in traffic with the cars. And I thought that was dangerous. Um, You'll but be yeah. winding up, please, okay. Ms. Williams. But again, thank you, working with staff. We hope that sidewalk connection, and just thank you for your time. And thank you for your service to the city yeah. as well. Um, we've had a last-minute addition, which my normal rule is, is I don't do last-minute additions. But I don't think you knew that rule, so I'm going <laughs> to let you speak. <laughs> I appreciate it. I won't take too much of your time. My name is Amanda Orand. We've heard that before. <laughs> uh, I promise. Um, <coughs> I'm the Lad Park HOA president, and I had to work late at the hospital today, so that's my good excuse that I was late attending, so sorry about that. Um, but. I wanted to come and make sure that you heard the voice of Ladd Park. Um, over 1,200 homes in Ladd Park, um, along with our friends in um, on our side of the interstate that are in favor of the long lane inter interchange across 65. Um, you know, something that's been on the books for many, many years. TDOT has already, you know, we talked about like, why does TDOT give money? How do they decide? They've already, you know, given us the gift of those columns. Um, it's something that's been needed for many, many years and is a forward thinking approach to avoiding the disasters that we see on Highway 96 with the traffic and failed intersections. The Goose Creek interchange is going to fail very soon. The engineers have already presented that data. It's going to happen with the in and out development, all of the other planned developments. Um, the traffic on Goose Creek is going to just get worse and worse. We have so many um, people moving into this area for homes and coming to work. Um, and then as far as the safety issue, you know, our kids driving along Long Lane, approaching the truck stop, going across the gauntlet of all the semis, turning fast, you know, and flipping their tractor trailers. Um, it's just uh, that dangerous curve around Long Lane and the truck stop is just many accidents waiting to happen. And we did lose um, a homeowner several years ago on a motorcycle at that intersection where the truck stop is. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure that you heard from me personally to plead with you, please consider that long line. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we go to item 12 now? Item 12 is um, City of Franklin contract 2023-0239 with STV Inc. for City Hall owner's representative. I'll kick this off in terms of an overview of our process and the recommendation that we have before you tonight. Uh, as you see, uh, this was uh, a process authorized by the board last fall in terms of identifying proposals for potential owner's reps for the City Hall project. In what you authorized was a process that was a request for proposal where qualifications were submitted and then a separate um, sealed cost was provided in conjunction with that. So our typical process is to identify the best qualified and most responsive uh, entity to those RFPs. 
Uh, so we went through that process, identified a review of all the written submittals, and from that decided to interview the top three rated firms. And that occurred initially with a group of essentially the City Hall staff project, uh, project team along with your designee, uh, Alderman uh, Baggett. So that was an initial interview process that took place there. There was scoring provided. In the meantime, the board also provided some additional direction as we reviewed the final schematic design that it would be appropriate to take a construction manager at risk approach relative to the project. There was a need for further clarity from the proposing entities, so we had a second interview and a updated proposal uh, submission opportunity for each of the three that had been interviewed with the understanding that the construction manager at risk approach was going to be taken and with the, that specific clarity in mind. So from that uh, additional review was, took place, a staff team including myself, uh, two of our assistant county administrators, Mark Hilty, Christine Brock, and then our facilities and project manager, uh, Brad Wilson, participated and rated that. Alderman Baggett also sat in on that interview but did not rate because he had done a previous rating um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the earlier round. You see the scores that are uh, allocated by those two, those two interview panels. Uh, collectively, uh, there was one uh, fairly strong choice among those three in terms of the, the differentiation among three qualified firms. In fact, uh, there are 10 people that participated in the interview. Eight of those 10 identified at S STV as the top uh, responding entity. So when we've identified a top firm the next step is to go ahead and work with them in terms of is there the ability to reach a negotiation on scope and cost related to the project. And that's what we have been able to do and that's what we present to you tonight in terms of that recommendation. Uh, and I, I, would, I won't go into great detail, but I will say I think what uh, the key differentiation was that um, what we saw in the presentation and the approach to the project. We had a firm that both has a local presence with uh, 20, 25 local employees, as well as a capacity backed by a large multidiscipline national firm. Uh, it is also the only firm that provided a dedicated local person 100% to the project. So I think those were key project components and, and proposal components that I, uh, that I would summarize as, as bringing us to the recommendation that's before you tonight and that is on both agendas, both for discussion tonight and the work session and for a vote um, in conjunction with the, uh, the phase three design work that, that had been uh, moved to this meeting as well. I, I did invite uh, representatives from STV uh, to be here, and I'd like to invite them to come up now, because uh, I think you should hear from them. Uh, this is a little different than a normal consulting arrangement. There's a direct relationship uh, that they'll, they will have in sharing information with the board. There's a baseline understanding of a minimum of quarterly reports and then other elements as we, uh, as, as we go through the, uh, a very important project. So I just wanted to give them an opportunity for you to, to hear from the folks locally that will be tied into the project project committed to delivering this and uh, give them an opportunity just a couple minutes to talk about who they are and their approach to the project so take it away thank you Eric uh, good evening I'm Jerry Stump I'm the president with push your green button there please Mr. good evening Jerry Stump I'm a president with STV I'm located here in, in our Franklin office I'll also serve as your project principal for this project so I'll be available from beginning to end uh, making sure that all the resources that Eric referred to are, are made available as appropriate. Um, we have our project manager here with me this evening. Chris Kepper, project manager. Dedicated. Push your button there, please. Chris Kepper, the dedicated project manager and uh, on-site representative for the project. So one of my roles will be to make sure that, that um, Chris has all the resource and all the expertise at his disposal uh, throughout this project. We're both committed to you from beginning to end. Um, we enjoyed the process that we've gone through with your staff and with Alderman Baggett so far. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of a 60-minute interview, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have or fill in any additional details that, that you might like to know. 
Uh, we are a 3,000 person professional services firm. Uh, we have individuals within our firm that have served um, on every facet of a project similar to this. We have architects and engineers who have planned and designed similar facilities. We have people who have served as owners. They've sat in the seats that you're in, um, managing a project, delivering that project for a community from an owner's perspective. We have individuals such as Chris and others who have served as contractors. They built similar facilities, so they understand what to anticipate through this process, how to avoid risks, mitigate risks, uh, work with your staff and with you and your community uh, to, to make sure we get the biggest value out of the project. And then we have hundreds of people in our firm who have served in the owner's rep role, which is what we're uh, being proposed to serve with you all on this project. Um, we are a local firm. We do understand what's important to the city of Franklin. Uh, many of us have lived here for many, many years. Uh, we know what the unique opportunities are in Franklin. We know what the challenges are. Uh, we know what's important to the citizens of the community because we are citizens of the community. But we back that up with the national expertise of a firm that's delivered literally hundreds of similar projects. Uh, we either currently or recently have completed over $3 billion uh, in valued projects using the construction manager at risk process. We understand how to deliver a project using this method. We bring that national expertise, lessons learned from projects all over the US. We apply that with our local knowledge. Uh, we serve right alongside you uh, to make sure we deliver uh, the project that the community desires and that the board wants to deliver. Um, very quickly, I'll just talk a little bit about how we do that. Uh, I've talked about the local national, we're committed to on time and within budget. So there's a few things that we'll do to uh, make sure that we meet that challenge. One is value engineering. It's not an event, it's a process. We don't do it one time, we don't do it twice. It's a continual process throughout um, the project's life. We couple that with what we call a gating process. Many times on a project like this, you'll have a design to bid kind of mechanism in your contract with your designers. I don't know if you have that here, but it, it really doesn't matter because we couple that value engineering with that gating process. So every time an alternative comes up, whether that's a design alternative or something the um, contractor proposes, we approach that through that gating process. What value does it bring to the project? What additional cost or cost savings does it bring to the project? And then how do those marry and how does that best serve what we're trying to deliver here? Uh, we will use that process throughout. Chris will be uh, integral in that. Um, he's used to using that process uh, and knows the, the places to look for those advantages and opportunities. One of the things that, that we have done um, is include a project management information system and a dashboard element in this project. We've used this successfully on projects all over the country. It's a very robust uh, process and documentation tool. We'll use that from the very beginning of the project until closeout so that when that project is done and we hand that over to your staff for operations and maintenance and upkeep, they have all of the documentation from the beginning to the end. We also use that to help us make decisions throughout the process. Now, all of that information is available to all of the stakeholders in the project. So the board, um, staff, designers, construction manager, they all have access to that information in real time. Uh, we use that to make timely decisions. One of the best things we can do in this is save time on the schedule. And so timely decisions is critical. This is one tool that we use to make sure that those decisions are being made timely and we're staying on schedule. We couple that with a dashboard that each of you would have access to so that you also have that real-time information. Um, we use that for executive level presentations, for decision making, key project indicators, how are we tracking, how is our progress uh, compared to our resource loaded schedule. Um, the CMAR procurement another great opportunity uh, for us to bring value to you. Uh, we've utilized that method numerous times across the country. Uh, we will expedite that process uh, and, and work with you in developing the most advantageous um, contract terms and conditions. 
for your construction manager at risk so that you know you're getting the value that you're trying to from that method. And then finally, compliance and financial management. Uh, we are extensively experienced with GASB 34 and the other accounting methods that you all use here. Uh, we will follow those same. We'll incorporate that from the beginning of the project to the end. So again, it's a seamless handover when the project is completed. So I've taken a few minutes and tried to break down a 60 minute um, presentation. But again, I'm happy to answer any questions. Our project manager is happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions from the board? Alderman Bland. Um, I do have a note from Matt that I'm going to ask in a minute. But um, <clears throat> Jerry, you said deliver the project on budget. Why not say under budget? OK, noted. I mean, on budget sounds great. That's just the medium blend. Yeah. But we I mean, will strive at every opportunity to bring this in under budget. I just Absolutely. would like that mindset in your vocabulary. On Absolutely. budget's different than under budget. Um, the other thing, and this is more, I guess, kind of, in looking at the top three firms and as you walk through the beginning, I don't necessarily agree with Patrick not being able to vote twice if he is our person. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was correct. Um, I think it takes our voice away from the final decision, um, and he is who we chose. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not happy about that. The other thing that I'm curious about is your initial proposed fee was almost, almost, three million dollars, mm -hmm. and now when we revise the proposed fee, it comes in over fifty percent less. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. To me, it's black or white, and this feels gray. And when we put out proposals, everybody has the same opportunity. And I know you're gonna debate this, but I have to say what it looks like when you look at this, when you're ranking people based on different criteria, um, all things being equal, I would like to think that we look at a cost savings um, from the onset. Um, if you go down further, the other two that were um, in the running were very neck and neck across the board. So explain to me why there was such a reduction in the fee um, so I can understand that. Let me address it first from the process and then maybe STB can talk about how they responded to it. When we originally put this out, it was not clear the construction method that would be taken. Uh, so we, we had, I think there was generally a sense that it might be a design bid build, a more traditional approach in terms of how we've delivered capital projects in the past. So that was a clarity we had. And I, I think in their response, they kind of gave us the kitchen sink of everything they could provide in a project. Again, you identify the most qualified and then you negotiate the scope that fits the project and that's scope and cost. So their starting point was pretty much everything they could provide. We provided the same opportunity to everybody to submit a cost first at uh, just the next phase only. So you see that, that's that middle column. We gave, gave each firm the opportunity to provide us a cost for that stage only. Because one of the ideas was, what if we just take it through the next stage and then look at our need to add on the final, the final stage of construction and do it sort of a step at a time. That was a concept. So everybody had the same chance to submit that cost. And then when we provided <coughs> the opportunity for the, the full updated submittal with the knowledge that construction manager at risk was the approach we we're taking and that the board had provided that direction. Everybody had a chance to, to submit updated information. That included cost. Two of the three chose to give us a, a, a modified cost based on that scope and what they proposed. And so uh, and this and we had a pretty detailed discussion about what was the difference, what changed. And so that's that's part of what was submitted and explained to us in that second stage of interview. Well, and thank you for the explanation, but you have to and understand. And I can let them speak to maybe more. When you look on paper it, and you look at the differences, it's it's like, wait a minute, what's going on? Well, and and it's it should be clear. I want to make it clear. And I'm giving you the opportunity. Every, to do that. Everyone was given the same opportunity to give us both a cost for just the next phase and then a cost for the, the whole project with an updated understanding of how the city was gonna approach project delivery. So everybody, again, had the same opportunity. We did ask for a specific cost, 
and that was provided by two of the three firms in terms of a specific proposed cost. So I, I will add to that, and I'll go back to your first comment, too. Sure. Everything we're going to do on this project is viewed through either a value lens or a budget lens. So coming under budget, I'm 100% with you. Awesome. To your specific question now, when we approached this the first time, there basically was no scope. There was an opportunity to provide an owner's rep or construction manager service. So we took the approach of here is everything that can be involved in serving an owner in a project like this, right? And then we priced that from the bottoms up. And that's where that initial price came from. Then you realize as, the scope changed. As the project has developed, we found, okay, you really don't need all of those things. Some of those you can do yourselves. Some of those your designer is providing. Some are things that have already been done. So we reduced that scope back to things that were actually now going to be included going forward. And as that scope continued to be clarified, then we adjusted the um, fee appropriately commensurate with that scope clarification. So that's how it changed from one to another. Yeah, I just think, and obviously I don't deal in RFQs and RFPs. Mm -hmm. I read about them on the screen. Mm -hmm. It seems very interesting that we would put out something and then everybody has a chance to rebid knowing what the original bid was, even if the scope of work yeah, changed. And, and that was a submittal, again, provided the same opportunity and it was provided in a um, outside of what others had submitted when that was. I do appreciate provided. the fact that there are local relationships because I do think that it is not often that as a city that we're able to work with people who have skin in the game and will drive by this building on their way everywhere. So that is an important part of the equation for me. One um, of the things we talked about at length with both of your selection panels was that investment in the project. Um, we do live here, we do work here, we do worship here, we play here, all of those things, right? Um, we talked about this being a legacy opportunity for the city of Franklin. We take that very seriously. As citizens of the community, we feel that same excitement and responsibility that you do to deliver this project. We are totally invested. Um, Matt Brown, if I may, or do you want to go to somebody else and no, not hear my ahead. voice? Go ahead with the Matt's comment. Okay, Matt He's wrote this. not going to make it back. No, sir, he wrote this for me before he left. So um, this is really addressed to Patrick more than you all, so forgive me for that. But And he chicken scratch. So as an advocate for an owner's rep in our chosen rep in the process, what are your thoughts on this recommendation or anything else for us to know that would be important? Patrick, asked by Matt Brown. I think that... And if um, you need to read that, because no, I said I'll, it like a second grader. I know what he's trying to ask. Um, I think that if you think back to where we were four months ago, five, six months ago, we were, as BOMA, being... Um, had a fantastic staff team working on this. We, I was sensing frustration, some frustration, the cost escalations. We were running out of tools in our tool belt as, as aldermen and what we could do to help, like how, what, that we felt like levers we could pull. And this process has delivered already ideas that have been generated from all three interviews, quite frankly. Um, the CMAR process came out of this. The, uh, we, I, would, I would argue that this solidified the CMAR process uh, for Say us. The, acronym out loud the uh, construction manager at risk, which has a guaranteed maximum price. So, so much good has come out of this. Um, I think there's more to come. And so, I would say that um, in support of the, the greater vision of what the we're doing here at the city and mm -hmm. building City Hall, that um, we would we would move forward. This I, I would also say. The, that comes with more work to be done. And I think Eric and I have had some great conversations about what that looks like now that if we go into the next phase, uh, as we go into the next phase, and how that looks, because quite honestly, like I, we don't want to be nine months down the road and kind of getting the things we were getting, which was not bad, but we would, but costs keep going up and we're value engineering, but costs keep going up. And like at some point we've got to say, we got to say, this is too much and we've got a budget. Um, and then have someone day to day that is has done these before, has delivered, uh, and is 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 turning over every single rock, 
and not exhausting our staff time that was quite honestly being overutilized for this project uh, to a point that, you know, it, it was a whole lot. And we're, this is a big deal. And so I think to answer Matt's question more simply, simply that we've got to move forward. There's more work to do. Um, the process is the process, and here we are. Um, the price is fair now, um, and so I think we have to make some decisions to move forward as a city. But also, there's some teeth coming, you know, in the next phase where we've got to we've got to rein this in. Alderman Barnhill. From beginning to end, 1.292 million dollars. Okay, I think. I, I, I was listening to what Brandon thinking the same thing. I was surprised that we would be able to come in on the second round, knowing what everybody bid on the first round, and reduce it 1.7 million. I've listened to the reason, uh, and that's that's fine. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not arguing about the reason, but I'm still surprised at that. Who do you report to? I report directly to the CEO of our company. No, no, no. Here. Oh, I report to you. Okay. I will work through Eric. Um, I will work with um, whoever your, if it continues to be Patrick or whoever your designated uh, alderman in is, is as well. I assume you're going to execute our contract, so that's who I will report to. Okay. Let me speak to that. I, I would say on a day to day basis, it's through the city administrator. But they're reporting to you on a regular basis in terms of project oversight and information directly to you. So that's it, it's it's almost like we're adding a, another department of the city to develop and deliver the the the, the city hall project. So on the day to day basis, it's just like you do with with other staff components. It works through the city administrator. So I want to clarify that, that that's how that will work so that they, that decisions can be made and we facilitate both what happens on the project but also what needs to come to you as a board in a, an efficient timely manner on a day-to-day -day basis what if you disagree if we disagree with staff yes what if there's a cost-cutting measure there someplace that you say hey you know what you can cut you know you don't have to put brass doorknobs on the door or something you can put mm -hmm. sheet metal or something other i don't know what you put on there but what happens when that when you say that because that's on a day-to-day -day basis is it not yes. eric can i can i yeah. share like the yeah. next step you and i talked about yeah. this afternoon Absolutely. which i yeah. think is going to answer your question yeah. i think cool. the next stage is we got to set a budget and not just a budget but then we got to tighten the belt even more to send them into the project and go find these measures so maybe it's 15 percent we say hey you need to go work 15 percent bring it back to us and we get to decide we get, but something a target budget it may not be that much i'm not trying to throw out a number don't hold me to a number yeah. but we've got to decide on a number for them to go back to this next phase and say if we're not going to see this keep escalating what do we not have to do now to be proactive to keep this from continuing to escalate and that, that so that doesn't actually answer your question, but it it's that's good, coming. It, it gets close. It yeah, gets and, close. And the reality is you all meet every two weeks, and we'll make sure the right information and right decision points get to you at the right time. That's how we work. But they've got to have guidance and support on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's what, what we'll provide. So it's really it's really kind of both, and that's why I wanted them to step up here because there's a different and, – and you to talk to them because there's a little different relationship than a typical consultant in that they are reporting to you on this project directly on a regular basis as we track it and deliver it. So it's, it's really kind of both working together. And, um, you know, I'm not going to edit what they say in terms of uh, cost saving ideas and concepts. We'll give you pros and cons like we do on everything and give you options and help facilitate decision making uh, where it's appropriate for the board to, to give that guidance without going into a great deal of detail you understand this 99 million dollars that's that that's and it's escalated over time and over time and at one time it was 84 and it went to 99 and we've had numbers scattered around but i think the board i know i have been concerned about the fact that it's that particular price and that particular cost for 90 something thousand square feet 
What I'm expecting, what I was expecting from you is, is that if there's areas where we can save money, we want to save. That's my goal. I don't think we need to spend $99 million on a 91,000 square foot city hall. But that's up to you now to help us understand what we can do, do in order to spend less than $99 million. Yes, sir. And we need to spend $99 million because we're going to spend a million three to have you tell us. Yeah. Yes, sir. And that's part of what we have to do. Uh, and we will absolutely approach it that way. So a couple of things. First of all, you have a $99 million cost, whatever the number is. We need to know, and we don't know at this point, what is the hard construction cost of that $99 million and how much of that is soft cost. So when we start working with your designer and ultimately your contractor, we need to know what the hard cost number is to hold them to or under. Um, so there's some things to be done with your budget um, before we jump too far into this, and that's understanding how it's built uh, and what's a hard cost and what's a soft cost. Through our interview process and in our, uh, frankly, in our statement of qualifications, we've already offered some ideas on places to save schedule and money, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but we started that before um, this process was, was well engaged even. Uh, and so we're already thinking about that. We will have some ideas. And frankly, part of our job is to save you money. Part of our job is to deliver this project on time. That's critical I mean, to that's you and, that's and to money. this community. But we need to do that while we save money as well. May I ask a specific question of you then? There's two items on the agenda coming up. One is to appropriate $5.35 million. I think you need to be involved in that and look at that before the board votes on $5.35 million going to the city administrator to pay for the architectural drawings or whatever he's doing. If you're going to come in on this, you need to come in on it now, not after we've sat here and spent another well, not another, because we haven't spent 5.4 million, but in order for us to spend 5.4. On the, on the agenda tonight, those are reversed. The 5.4 million comes before we approve your contract. Respectfully. Go ahead. That, that's your decision to make, obviously. Thank you. Um, I would tell you again, from the beginning of this process, We've pointed out that the sooner you have an owner's rep on board, whether that's us or someone else, the sooner you have that person, that firm on board, the more opportunity there is to save you time yeah. and yeah. money on the project. So the longer this goes without having that, that gating process, that check and balance, the less opportunity there is uh, to find those savings. So to, I think you were asking a question. Uh, to answer your question respectfully, I, I agree with you. I think doing that is premature. Um, I don't think it's the end of the world if, if you want to move forward with that, but it does take one more card away from the opportunity that we have to play. Thank you. Alderman Caesar. Thank you, Mayor. So I think there's two items here for discussion in my mind. The first is the process of how we got to the, the table that's on the board. Um, have we thrown out Alderman Baggett's scores in interview scoring number two? No. He it's didn't score it. It's in the blended. Yeah, it's, it's in, in the blended. The blended He's but, in there. But he didn't get to score again. Right. Perhaps could Alderman Baggett speak to would his score have changed <laughs> if you were given this opportunity to score this group again? Uh, and you don't have to answer it, uh, Patrick. You know, I just think that it, it, to me it, it doesn't feel great no. that we conducted an interview and we gave everybody the same instruction, just mm -hmm. some chose to enter into it differently. And then we reconvened, but we kept the voting body, the people's representative, out of it. And so, Eric, I, I feel like it's important for us to represent that this doesn't look great mm -hmm. from my chair yeah. and from the people that I'm here to represent. I don't feel like it builds a great deal of trust for me that this was truthful and transparent, and I'd like to see I'll, us I'll, I'll, I won't. But it, I want to address it, that. Maybe, yeah. maybe go, that's no, you go, I, go, go for wrong, it. Go for it. Feel more comfortable go for it. Well, let me just say this. It was... It was, and, and Patrick and I discussed this, so this isn't just something I did on my own. That's right. This is something we talked about. Yeah. Okay. We talked about whether we should bring other people back that have been in the process. I wanted to have the opportunity to 
see each of the firms eye to eye on my end because I needed to make that recommendation. I had not done that yet. So the thought was, let's bring in folks that had not seen them, fresh look, and, and, and have that weigh in. Patrick sat in there so he could see it, ask questions, fully participate. And so the idea was, are you overweighting it if you have the same person vote twice? Uh, you know, that was just, that was the only concept. That's what I brought up. This is a suggestion that was made. That's what we proceeded with. Yeah, and I so would. It wasn't something we. It, it, it wasn't he nefarious. usurped, yeah, he please, usurped please our that way. voice. But no, that wasn't what we did. This is yeah. what we, uh, we talked sure. about. No, in I would terms say, of the I, Eric and I agreed on this, and here's why. Um, no. Is that this is a whole new set of people in there? Those assistant city administrators were in there. A whole new set of people. My vote was included on the first one, which, quite frankly, anyway, um, showed a different story. But you know, I and Eric will tell you. Everyone who's been involved on the staff side will tell you. Um, I've been extremely involved in this process, and there has been. Um, Truth, Eric has, has led this well. Um, I don't know that my vote in this would change what Eric and staff are recommending to you right now. And so even, even if I voted in a different way, you would still be f faced with a situation where you're going to have staff recommending something. And I'm not even going to talk to you about what I might, what, what if, if, if my vote was in there, what it might look like. Because the scores may not change. We have a decision that we can move forward with City Hall on good local, re great local re representation, national scope, a price that's now fair. Um, you can rewrite history, you can do things different, but we got a city hall to build and these people are qualified. And I think it's time to move forward with that. And we will learn from what, how, what we've done. And I think the next time we build an, another building, we will look at a different process. But the way that this is done has been very fair to all concerned and um, I think uh, we should we should move forward and, and get get on with the business of saving some money. Well, I, I appreciate the color, yeah. and thank you, Patrick, for taking the opportunity to help us feel more comfortable with it. And so, if it came off as as mm. that maybe transparency wasn't there, mm -hmm. it was because I didn't have this that complete was, yeah. expo explanation. Yeah. And I think the second piece is about evaluating the group. I love the fact that there's a local component. I love the fact that you're invested. Um, and I like the fact that it seems that Patrick is supportive of this group moving forward. And as our, our buyer or our owner's representative, I appreciate his feedback. Alderman Berger. I'm not sure what I can say. <laughs> I just, um, um, I don't, I don't have a problem or accusing anybody of anything. I mean, you did what you did. You you con you you uh, had a conversation. You communicated. That's all great and fun. But I do feel a little shortchanged because you were our representative and you were supposed to actually do the voting, and that shortchanged us. Possibly, maybe not. We don't know. You know, and you gentlemen sitting there, I have nothing personally against you. <laughs> I mean, there's this is not a personal thing. I'm just looking at it from our perspective here. Um, and you have a uh, subsidiary here of your company. Your, your comp the company is actually in New York and Pennsylvania, the corporate headquarters, correct? And so your, but your office is here and you are local. Um, but, I, but it's not a homegrown local company. It's out of New York and Pennsylvania. Just make sure that that was correct. I'll make sure you don't have to deal with anyone from yeah, New York. Please don't. <laughs> but you're here locally and you guys are, that's fine. Um, the, the comment about saving money, uh, you know, I just don't want to save money to the detriment of the building. We can't do that. This is too big of a project. What was the amount, and we gave you the go ahead for 50000 was it? What was the amount that we were supposed to vote on last time to go ahead? We did not do that. Five million. Five million? It's 50, no, we just deferred. No, it was 50, we, deferred, we deferred the item till tonight in terms tonight. of the next and phase of design. And then you will spend 50000 tonight on that? No. If we... No. You have a decision about whether to move into the next phase of design. Make, okay, yeah, fine. For the final design and, and construction documents. Yeah. Every single time 
I, I, I agree with you, Jerry. Every every moment we delay, and you know, I've got I've got a few issues, and I don't think I'm going to bring them up tonight. But um, you know, it's just I I think sometimes it has to do with cultures of companies um, and and things of that nature. But that's beyond the point. And uh, I just think we have to move ahead. And I'm not real comfortable with this in a way, but I'm not for delaying it either. And and will your company do a great job? You're very professional. You've been in this community forever and you have a good reputation of the job you have done in your previous jobs and companies. Thank you. So yes, everybody knows that. And so I know you're a man of integrity and you bring um, your expertise and in this company I would expect the same so I'm not worried about that I'm not worried about the job that you all were going to do so bottom line I think we just need to move ahead well, I appreciate that and I chose my words carefully earlier uh, in that we will view everything through two lens value and budget yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. We want a building that is going to serve this community for decades to come yeah. and serve it well. Yeah. Can we do that and stay under budget? I believe we can. Yeah, because I, I don't want you to come in and say, well, we can save a lot of money here, but then it cuts something out, and then five years down the road we go, shoot, we should have had that in the building. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Okay. Okay, we need to... Uh... Let, let, let me ask one more question. A month ago, help me out. A month ago on the agenda, we deferred $5.4 million. Tonight, we're being asked to defer $5,350,000. Are we not? That's your, that's your decision. You moved it to this meeting. We are asked to be a, we are being asked to approve right. on that particular item, 50000 less than we did a month ago. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and there are a couple other adjustments in that scope. Um, I think it's about 12 weeks shorter in terms of engagement, in terms of project delivery, so that's one element. It also does more directly acknowledge the construction manager at risk approach, and that, that's part of the modification. Uh, one of the, co one of the uh, cost estimates um, was able to be eliminated because what you're assigning to the construction manager and the owner's rep as part of this project. So you do have a slight reduction and you do have a um, modification of the scope that reflects the approach that we have now and uh and the board has identified and then it it it, it does um it you know, does provide an updated time frame for project delivery and the engagement overall so you didn't opt so you didn't take the option because we gave you the option a month ago you said you could spend up to fifty thousand. you did not do that then i did not um because I wasn't sure I really could do okay. that. Okay. <laughs> because well, of the, and, and, the and, existing. And we didn't encourage you yeah, to do that. And, and, you just said you yeah, could do that. I reviewed that with the city attorney. That was a uh, idea. <laughs> but we already have been engaged with the design team. So our ability to work within the authority you give me administratively right. had probably already been used you know, <laughs> because we'd done a contract with them. All right. So I, I really couldn't. I wasn't in a position to add that. Um, and we wanted to just get okay. this recommended and, and bring it back to you and take your guidance from there. All right, we need to finish up and we're gonna finish up quick. We appreciate <laughs> your coming. <laughs> Item seven is a contract with Tennessee Department of Transportation for a self-certification on ADA, which is pretty routine. Uh, Next is an ordinance to amend Chapter 4. We're going to put that off to another work session. Uh, that has to do with uh, uh, road impact fees. Number 9 is uh, reject the bids on Liberty Park Bridge. We'll be voting on that. Number 10 is a change in the Franklin Municipal Code relative to parking enforcement. Uh, it's, it helps us as far as state law and uh, uh, yeah, you're not voting on that now, but it essentially associates it with um, the transit 
function. Our parking enforcement can also relate to transit. That helps with the authority under which we um, do parking citations, et cetera. And the site, yeah, the electronic citation regulations is similar. Uh, it's you. different. Uh, it, it, well, it's related to the same area, but it's a different component that allows us for a five-year period to collect a $5 fee that gets at essentially technology implementation and updates. And we're all already in the middle of a software program implementation. This would help offset some costs. Uh, it's a $5 electronic processing fee that we have a, a defined window that we can apply it to, to gotcha. tickets. And the Sanitation Environmental Services Department cost of service study, we're sadly going to put that off also. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Sorry. they were awful nervous about presenting it. So we're adjourned and we'll be back in about 10 to 12 minutes. <laughs>